This story was about this loser who was hailed as humanity's public enemy number one. But unlike Ryumin and Ronin who died virgins, this guy had an ex-girlfriend whose heart was broken just because our main character ditched her for the hottest mommy, ahem. I mean mercenary. Allow me to narrate how the world's greatest villain, who was persecuted by the people, ended up saving the whole world against the world's strongest hero. Also, if you guys are wondering what's the title of this manhwa, it's The Genius Assassin Who Takes It All. The story opened in Seoul, South Korea. Currently, Seoul has entrusted its future to a single person. This man is catching his breath amidst the chaotic and dusty field. His name is Zhang Shiwan, the guildmaster of Jungwa. When the dust was cleared away, a man wearing all black stood in front of Shiwan's exhausted body. The crowd before had a horrified expression. They couldn't believe the fate of the Yonghua guild. The man in black assumed a combat stance. He told Shiwan that finally, they're the only ones left. This man in black is a public enemy of the world called Shin Kang Hu. Shiwan's body is trembling. Shiwan slowly stood up as he blamed Kong Hu for starting meaningless fights that caused everyone to suffer. He bursts into anger as he releases his power and exclaims, It's because of evil like you. Kang Hu smirked and replied, What a joke. He mocked Shi Huan by asking him if he thinks of himself as a messenger of justice. This caught Shi Huan off guard. Shi Huan clenched his teeth in anger. He asked Kang Hu if he dared to talk about justice, his hand emitting a red light as he got ready for a fight. His powers grew stronger, with a lightning-like light covering one side of his body. He yelled that he was fighting on behalf of everyone. Angry, he told Kang Hu that he always interferes. The crowd appeared distressed. He continued asking, what the hell are you, if not evil? Shiwan's intense emotions frightened the crowd, making even a child cry. All of a sudden, the crowd cheered for Shiwan. They cheered louder, but Shiwan maintained a serious expression. Another blinding red light formed around his hand, as he informed Kang Hu that as long as the crowd cheers for him, he vowed not to be taken down at any cost, extending his hand towards his enemy and channeling all his power. A rapid red light swiftly moved toward Kang Hu. Kang Hu was surprised and stayed frozen in his position. The attack caused a loud explosion, engulfing the area in smoke, dust, and debris. Even the onlookers had to move away to avoid it. Shi Huan approached the kneeling body of Kang Hu. He stood there in front of him. Kang Hu suffered severe injuries. The crowd cheered for Jiang Shiwan's victory. The crowd wore happy and relieved expressions. Someone mentioned they always believed in him, while another suggested it was time to end the bastard. They started chanting for him to kill Kang Hu. They raised their fists as they chanted louder, Kill him! Shi Huan expressed the obvious to Kang Hu, that nobody wishes for him to live. Shi Huan once again released his power. This time, he is emitting purple round light in his hand. Kang Hu did not dare to move as his body trembled. Shi Huan told him that it will be his end. At point blank range, Shi Huan unleashed his power, which blasted one side of Kang Hu's body. Kang Hu's body bleeds and he coughs up blood. His body collided with the ground. His last vision is seeing Shi Huan standing proudly. Afterwards, Shi Huan leapt, and while he was in the air, he merrily addressed the crowd and informed them that all their preparation has finally borne fruit. He announced that perfect freedom shall descend upon their land. The crowd looked at him with expressions of relief. With an elated expression, Shi Huan looked up at the now red sky. Dark red clouds hovered around him as his body glowed in red and a faint red light connected him to the clouds. The color changed, and everything took on a bloody red hue. Out of the blue, a large hand emerged from the red sky. The crowd was shocked and horrified, but Shiwan smiled as if he expected this. The hand started grabbing people, and it caused panic as they ran away for their lives. They yelled for everybody to run. While Shi Huan laughed and celebrated the descending of the demon king, 
he proclaimed that it is true peace. Kong Hu forced himself to reply that this was more like a true tyranny. Zhang Shihuan was taken aback and asked him how he's still alive. He encouraged him to open his eyes and take a good look at what's happening. He exhilaratingly announced the just world that he had created. And just like that, the world perished. A speck of light glowed in the midst of darkness. Displayed as if on a monitor, the message appeared. Thank you for all the love you have shown on the life of a villain turned savior. A pair of hands was busy typing on the keyboard, and this person thought that the reader expectations must have been crushed. The world's greatest hero, Shi Wan, was a henchman of the Demon King, and he and his comrades are called the Thirteen Stars. They were top-level long-standing evils, However, fiction is but a mirror reflecting reality. The novel's motif was the writer's life as a student. The author was at a funeral and he placed a flower in front of the student who passed away. The author used someone from reality as a reference for Shihuan. He was able to see authority that could even cover up school violence and the true face of the world, a power that could overturn good and evil. And for that reason, he incorporated reality into the novel. He then read the people's comments on the novel. Most of them were not happy about the ending. Evil prevailed just because the people chose to support the wrong person. This made the author pissed. He guessed that it couldn't be helped. He then closed the browser and left his computer to sit in his bed. His room already showed the amount of frustration he got just from creating a desirable novel for his readers. One of the commenters expressed his frustration that the author had an open ending. The author decided to lay in his bed. He recalled another comment which says, he's the kind of guy who brags with his arms crossed in real life. The comments bothered the author. He placed his arm over his eyes. He recalled another comment which says that he's a henchman for destroying the reader's world. The author clenched his teeth as he held back his feelings. He thought that this is not what he wanted. And now, he's at the point of no return, since he couldn't rewrite anymore. He decided to sleep it off. The author was slowly awakening from his deep slumber. He wondered why it was so noisy. Upon opening his eyes, he witnessed people in uniforms and mining the ground. He saw himself in the same blue overall uniform and noticed that he's laying on a stone floor. All of a sudden, a man yelled in anger. He called the guy crouched in the ground a fucking piece of shit. The angry man continued to kick the poor guy while he told him, how dare you, despite Eclipse's grace. The author caught that, and Eclipse seemed familiar to him. As the guy is being kicked, the author recalled a student being in the same position as before. This student also looked similar to the crouched guy in front of him. The author was pissed that the bastard was showing up in his dream. The angry man grabbed the guy on his collar and was ready to punch him as he continued to curse at him. He angrily told the guy that he should keep his useless worker act to himself. As the fist was about to land on the guy's face, everybody came to a halt and watched a scene before them. A man appeared in front of the author and this man was about to punch him. The man recognized him. The man punched him several times as he explained that he knew him as the guy who couldn't even last for one second. The author wondered why his body hurts when he's just in a dream. Another man intercepted the violence. He told the man to stop since the author has a long way from meeting his quota. The author started wondering if it was really a dream because it feels extremely real. The man spit in front of him. Before the man completely turned away, he threatened the author that he's going to beat him up one day. The beaten up guy hurriedly approached him and asked him if he's okay. This guy calls him by his name Kang Hu. He wondered why he's being called Kang Hu. He looked at his hands and run to confirm his suspicion. His hand dropped to the ground near a body of water. His body was then covered in blue light and he recognized that it was a mana and then it became stronger, as if the light were being sucked into his body. He realized that he has the power to absorb mana at will. It is called innate mana hypersensitivity, and he's fully aware of that. 
he had a suspicion, so he looked at his reflection in the water and confirmed that he just became Shin Kang Hu. He laughed in disbelief that he was Kang Hu of all people. He looked at the concerned guy in front of him and concluded that since the guy's still alive, the timeline should be around five years before the ending. He thought that only if he possessed Shi Huan, he would at least be revered as the world's hero. But he knew that at that rate, the ending would be the descending of the demon king, and only the followers' lives will be saved. He knew that if he didn't change the ending, he would die in a pathetic way. He stood up with good news in mind, and that is the knowledge that he possessed on how to escape the place. A blue gem fell to the ground. He picked it up. The possessed Shin Kong Hu expected that the real person's past and experiences are also his. He opened his status window, which revealed that character information. Kong Hu is an assassin at level 10. After picking up the gem, he fell on his knees. He cursed as he realized that his stamina was low. In his mind, he regretted giving Kang Hu a weakness like innate mana hypersensitivity just because he's an anti-hero. He knew one way to help himself. He drew a star symbol on the ground using the gem. His friend ran towards him and asked if he's okay. Our MC then quickly erased what he drew on the ground using his foot. He answered that it was nothing. His friend asked if he should suggest giving them a break. Kong Hu laughed and replied that if they were people who let the workers rest depending on their condition, they wouldn't have dragged them in that place in the first place. The place was a detention center created by a criminal organization called Eclipse. Rookie hunters who can use mana are forced to work like a slave to mine mana stones. Kang Hu told his friend not to worry about him and just focused on mining stones. His friend asked, are you... He continued the sentence for his friend and replied, thinking of escaping. He dropped the topic and told his friend to work before he's beaten up by the guard. And he warned his friend not to do anything reckless. They continued their work. Kang Hu thought that he did what he could by warning his friend. His friend is a character that he made as a reference to a student that knew. He thought that he couldn't make any changes to the novel yet, and that is for the sake of his escape. The mine was bustling with workers. Kang Hu pushed a cart full of gems. His attention shifted to the person who suddenly groaned in pain. He saw his friend beaten up by a guard. The guard announced to the workers that the moment the guard's attention was focused on the newbies, there's a crazy bastard who tried to escape. The guard pulled out his blade and told everyone to watch closely. He told the guy that he will be responsible for doing crazy things. And the guard stabbed the guy on his back. The workers were all surprised, including our MC. The guard continued to stab the guy. The guy groaned in pain. The workers looked away as the blood was being spilled to them. But Kong Hu kept his gaze. A few more groans were emitted by his friend until it ended when his body reached its end. Kong Hu stood in front of the corpse. In his mind, he told him that he already warned him not to do anything reckless. He continued watching his friend in silence. The guard taunted him by suggesting he should act up like he did last time. The guard expressed that since there's no one to stop him, he could kill him too. Kang Hu replied that he couldn't care less about the guy dying. The guard was taken aback. Kang Hu changed the topic and asked the guard to let him go to the toilet. The guard assumed that he pissed on himself and called him a pathetic bastard. He remained silent while the guard agreed while laughing at him. The guard told him that he should follow him. When they were in front of the restroom, the guard told Kang Hu that he only had one minute. And the guard warned him that if he took longer than that, the place would instantly be his grave. Kang Hu walked inside and saw several corpses on the ground. He continued to walk as he recalled that what he's looking for is somewhere around there. The guard counted to serve as a timer. Fortunately, Kang Hu found what he was looking for. He immediately drew on the ground using the blood that he found. The guard continued counting, and with 18 seconds left, he finished the drawing of a circle with a star in the middle. The drawing glowed. Kang Hu started talking to the circle. He uttered that he knew that someone was now watching him. 
He told him that he knew he goes crazy for tragedias, trials, and depression. Kang Hu was interrupted when the guard knocked and told him that he had ten seconds left. He continued to talk to the circle, asking it if he's curious as to how a low level like himself can summon him. Kang Hu knew that if stayed a little longer just like in the novel, the entity that he was talking to would appear later. And he knew that the entity would tell him that if he hesitated a day longer, the hope that world is looking for would be further out of reach to persuade him. Kang Hu is aware that once he summons this entity, he will be the entertainment for this entity. He continued to tell the circle that he is the only person qualified to use the ability effectively. He had a wide smile on his face as he expected the appearance of the summoned entity. The main constellation who made a contract with Kang Hu in the novel is called Dimension Looter. Dimension Looter called Kang Hu an insolent bastard, but since he caught his attention, he will allow him to borrow his power for a moment. He dared Kang Hu to prove himself to him. Kang Hu confidently answered that he should just stand back and watch. A screen containing the details of Dimension Looter appeared in front of Kang Hu, and at that moment, the guard forcefully opened the door. The guard angrily yelled, Are you fucking with me, bastard? The guard was looking at an empty room with smoke. He seemed to be distressed, and then he spotted a shadow amidst the smoke. A window screen appeared containing the changes in Kang Hu's status. It stated that all of his skills will now be upgraded to maximum proficiency, and that includes his only skill, called Short Distance Leap. Right now, it's at level one. But as the new skill of the said constellation took effect, it changed into max level. In a swift motion, he advanced towards the guard and immediately activated Traverse Teleportation. He was immediately out of sight. The guard was furious as he looked for him, but there was no one in the room. He was shocked to find out that Kang Hu was not there. Little did know, Kang Hu was already behind him and Kang Hu immediately stabbed him in the neck. He cursed at Kang Hu and asked, how? Kang Hu released his neck and the blood gushed out. The guard fell to the ground. Kang Hu looked at him and told him, thanks, dickhead. He said thanks because the guard helped him decide to leave the place today. Dimension Looter told Kang Hu that he was amazing, and it announced that the contract is complete. Kang Hu let out a breath. He then took the guard's knife as he thought that because of what he had done, he had already avenged his friend. Kang Hu kept the weapon in his bag. A system notification appeared to inform him that the weapon has been registered. Shin Kang Hu vowed that, from that point on, he won't look back. The night sky is illuminated with a bright full moon. The guard lay in his pool of blood while Shin Kang Hu walked away from him. A canister containing gasoline spilled inside the room. Kang Hu made sure that the gasoline was well spread in the area. The first step of his plan is to disguise himself, and it can be done through securing a rank two warden's uniform. And he lit up a lighter for his step two, arson. He dropped the lighter to the ground. He walked away from the room that was engulfed by fire. And he proceeded with his third step to escape through none other than the front gate. The guards outside the building panicked when they saw the fire. One guard furiously asked who did it while the other guard told him to call the fire department first. Several people were running away to ride a vehicle. One of the guards instructed to follow the manual and informed everyone to head out to the crematorium. The vehicle's door was shut tight. The last guard who entered instructed the driver to move quickly. The driver looked at the rearview mirror and inquired for the whereabouts of the warden. They asked Kang Hu, who's sitting on the back seat if he switched places with the rank two warden who's in charge of their unit. Kang Hu replied that someone just escaped from building 18. The driver was taken aback upon hearing the news. Kang Hu explained that the person who escaped ran through the fence on the northwest side of the building. He then asked the driver why they hadn't departed yet. The driver got intimidated and apologized while driving away. Kang Hu knew that the path that heads northwest from the fence is Chung Myung Mountain. At first glance, it looks like a good escape route since it's dark, unguarded, and complicated. 
But in reality, it's brimming with traps laid by Eclipse, making it the most dangerous route. Kang Hu leveraged on the information that is only known to the wardens to escape. He wore a serious expression as he told the story of how they were trying to catch the person who is trying to escape. He further discussed that even if they lose track of the person, he assumed that this person will head to Chung Myung Mountain, so all they need to do is just to bring back the corpse. The driver replied, Understood, sir. The guard of the fence yelled, Huarang! And the driver replied, Cigarettes! As if it was a secret code, the guard gave them all clear and opened the fence. In his mind, Kang Hu thought that finally he's getting past the shitty fence. They continue to drive down in the middle of the forest. The driver engaged Kang Hu to a small talk, assuming he's tired from the recent concerns in Building 18. Kang Hu replied that he is, and commented that killing the people would be easier since the fucking innates won't listen. The driver excitedly replied that he's right. He began to criticize the inmates by describing them as pieces of shit who are hunters only by name. But they're actually just losers. Kang Hu took a mental note of how the driver called the inmates pieces of shit. The guard on the passenger seat started having a small talk with him by asking him how long he had been on duty in Building 18. Kang Hu became wary of this guard. He responded that he came before yesterday. The guard asked if Kang Hu had been working in Unit 9. Kang Hu answered yes. The guard was suspicious of Kang Hu. He responded that Unit 9 doesn't exist, and since Kang Hu is part of it, the unit must have been formed the day before yesterday. This caught Kang Hu off guard. Their vehicle continued to traverse on the path in the middle of the forest. Kang Hu smiled and told him that he's right. He gripped his blade and answered that there's only one reason. All of a sudden, he sliced the guard on the passenger seat from behind. The blood forcefully spurted from his body. The driver was shocked and horrified. Kang Hu told them the sole reason for Unit 9 is to clean up pieces of shit like the guards. The driver immediately stepped on the brakes. Due to the abrupt braking, Kang Hu in the back seat lost his balance, causing his body to lunge forward. The headless corpse in the passenger seat was also lunged forward, causing the front glass of the vehicle to shatter and it was ejected from the vehicle. It landed face down on the dirt. The driver turned to Kang Hu while cursing and releasing flames in his hand. He threw a fireball at Kang Hu. However, Kang Hu managed to evade the danger. He cast a sidelong glance at the roof of the vehicle, now reduced to ashes and leaving a hole in the wreckage. The driver was surprised by Kang Hu's quick reflexes to step away from him. Feeling the anger of being tricked, the driver released another attack towards our MC. This time, the attack was even more powerful as it rained down fire directly at Kang Hu. The driver smirked and uttered, he ain't worth shit. All of a sudden, something caught his attention. He can see Kang Hu through the side mirror. Immediately, Kang Hu left his line of sight. Kang Hu surprised the driver by piercing his blade through the glass on the side of the passenger seat. And he did not hesitate to glide his blade on the driver's neck. With his force, the blade of the sword penetrated the window of the driver's seat. The driver looked at him with a horrified expression. Kang Hu pulled out his sword and blew Gushed out of the driver's neck. Agonising cook like sound can be heard from the driver as he falls out of the car. Out of the blue, Kang Hu felt a pang of pain in his head. He wondered if it was because he just used too much mana. His attention immediately drifted to the light coming from his behind. Upon checking the side mirror, he noticed that there's an incoming car. He cursed and wondered if it's police on patrol. It's one of the factors that he didn't expect to happen. He knew that this would be the last hurdle that he would face. He then leapt out of the car to slide on a cliff. He looked down and anticipated his fall. He slid down rapidly and landed safely on the ground. He was taken aback when he heard someone say that he's impressive for killing wardens and escaping. A person stood before him. This man held his axe-like weapon over his shoulder and called Kangu a low-level scum. He noticed the red mark above the man's head. 
It means that the man is a hunter who is in a contract with a constellation. Kangu wears a serious expression as he observes and wonders what kind of power the man possesses. A status screen showed up, and it displayed that the man has an ability to track mana. Upon learning that, Kang Hu realized that is why the man found him easily. But instead of being fearful, Kang Hu smiled and commented that it was a great opportunity. The man was baffled. For some reason, Kang Hu can see the constellation that the man is in a contract with, and the red mark above the man's head. He opened his status screen. And a third clause states that by killing another hunter, he is able to loot them of their contracted constellation. He glanced back at the hunter who's wearing a smug expression. A status window displayed that Kang Hu can loot the target. Kang Hu grinned as he felt the thrill of using the constellation loot for the first time. But for the man to make a contract with a constellation, it could mean that he's at least level 100 which means Kang Hu needs to avoid a head-to-head -head fight. As part of his plan, Kang Hu started running. He decided to draw in the man then attack. With the way Kong Hu is behaving, the man commented that he's really a low-level scum. Kang Hu rapidly ran towards the trees. The man told him to try his best to hide. The man activated his power and his eyes turned to blue. He commented how nothing can escape his sight. He scanned the area. He started walking around. He asked where he was hiding. He activated his vision again and noticed a trace of Kang Hu. He instantly turned to follow the swift movement, and he locked in on his target. Kang Hu appeared to be hiding behind a tree. The man laughed when he found him, and immediately threw his axe-like weapon while cursing. The weapon cleanly cut something. To his surprise, it was only a tree. He wondered where Kang Hu went, and all of a sudden he felt a sharp pain in his body. He did not expect Kang Hu to catch him off guard and instantly pierce him at his neck, leaving him no chance to react. Kang Hu told him that it was unexpected for a combat damage dealer to throw his weapon away. The man realized that he fell into Kang Hu's trap. Kang Hu told him that it was a mistake to look down on his opponent. Kang Hu sliced the man's neck and blood gushed out of his body. Kang Hu watched the man fall to the ground. A status window appeared and indicated that he killed the target and seized his contract with Skillful Connector. A Skillful Connector is under the control of Dimension Looter and is unable to escape outside of extinction or termination of the contract. And all of the abilities of Skillful Connector have been transferred to Kang Hu. Kang Hu was breathing heavily as he looked at his screen. He clicked on the arrow down to know more about his stats and it displayed that his Traverse teleportation, mana tracking ability, and night vision is at max level already. He was happy about his success. He then activated the mana tracking vision. He scanned the area and concluded that there's no more pursuers near him. All of a sudden, he felt a sharp pain throughout his body. He coughed and fell to his knees. His body trembled as he tried to hold himself up using his sword. His condition worsens as he coughed blood. He wondered if it was because he had pushed himself too far. He recalled what he did, and one if it was to hide his traces from the man. And to do that, he suppressed his mana hypersensitivity and hid. He then grabbed a stone and poured all his mana into it, because if he just left it as it is, he would automatically suck in all of the surrounding mana and this would reveal his location. So he endured to suppress his mana hypersensitivity state and immediately threw the rock away. The rock hit a tree, and this is what the man has caught wind of. And thanks to that, Kong Hu was able to successfully lure the man in and kill him. But it wasn't that easy, since in order to get closer to the man, Kong Hu had to use a short-distance leap. And all of that leads to the current state of his body. He's aware that if he pushes himself even more, he'd straight up die in there. He planned to immediately get to a safe place. As he walked in the forest, the night sky had already turned to a bright morning sky. He looked at the surroundings and thought that what he was expecting had arrived. Kang Hu looked down at the truck that transports the sand that purifies mana stones. He dashed towards its direction and leapt from the cliff. 
He landed safely on the sand, and he gazed up on the bright sky. Our MC laid there as he recalled how he killed three guards in the process of escaping, an event that didn't happen in the novel. He thought of making sure that the future doesn't change while he gets stronger, so that he can use the knowledge about the future to his advantage. He also thought that he means so little in the world that there's no way the future will change just because of what he has done. He continued to rest at the back of the truck as it drove through the highway. Kang Hu smiled. He gazed upon the body of water in front of him, and he couldn't help but say how beautiful it is. A conversation can be heard from outside the building. A person uttered that they can just catch new low lives who will mine mana stones, so it wasn't a big deal. He told everyone to get back to work. The person he is talking to replied that he understood it and left the room. The guy that was in the room commented how smart the escapee is. He wouldn't expect this escapee to catch them off guard and leave through the front gate. Meanwhile, Kang Hu struggles with the pain he's feeling. He pushed himself to enter a phone booth. He thought of how his stamina isn't easily recovering because of his excessive use of mana. He dialed a number on the button pad. Back to the man in the building. The man received the information that the escapee is a level 10 assassin whose residence can't even be found, but still was able to kill a level 45 and a level 55 with a constellation. Back to Kang Hu, the person he's calling answered the phone. He told the person on the other line that he's in front of Daejeon Station, and he requested a favor. Back to the man inside the building, he thought that the SKP was interesting and that it would turn out to be a fun hunt. Inside a house, Shin Kang Hu can be heard thanking a person named Han Seo Yon. He thanked her for treating him even when he asked out of the blue. Seo Yon addressed him as Opa and asked what happened to him. Kang Hu told her the truth that Eclipse kidnapped him. Seo Yeon was surprised to hear this. She asked him if he was dragged into a mana stone mine, since those guys are famous for kidnapping hunters. Kang Hu answered that mining mana stones is essential, so low-level hunters like him can't help turning into prey for the other hunters. But despite that, he trusted her and got in touch with her since he knew that she's still in love with Kang Hu. Seo Yeon cried and blamed herself. She thought that had she kept in touch with him more frequently, he wouldn't have to go through that. Kang Hu recalled that at the time of the breakup, she was a newbie hunter who had recently awakened. But right now, she's a level 150 veteran in a contract with a constellation. Kang Hu felt sullen, thinking that if she was with him back then, she would have been dragged to the Chung Myung Detention Center as well. He told her that she had cared for him enough, and that nothing good will come out of getting involved with him now. He warned her that Eclipse might even track her. She responded that she's at level 150 now. It means that she's at a level where average hunters can't mess with her carelessly. Kang Hu was stern as he responded that she doesn't need to worry about him, and advised her to use her power for herself. She gave him clean clothes, and told him that she placed a decent amount of cash and a hacked cell phone in the pocket. She assumed the cell phone would be untraceable. Kang Hu remarked on how her guild is operating in a gray territory. Our MC realized that back then, and even now, a guild suits her. She asked him if he has no plans of joining their guild. She started saying that they can go back like they used to. He called her in a serious tone and told her not to stay trapped in the past. Tears welled up in her eyes. She smiled, hiding her face as tears dripped down. She replied how he's right. She explained to him that she had taken care of his request. One of her friends is a leader, and the details are on the phone. She gave him a warm smile and told him to take care and to stay well. He replied, thanks. I hope you stay well, too. Kang Hu hailed a cab and asked the driver to take him to Dajin Station. The driver asked him if he could turn on the radio. Kang Hu told him that it's not a problem. The radio announced news about Yung Hua Guild, assassinating the entire White Rose Mercenary Corps. The news talked about Judgment Day. Kang Hu recalled how Judgment Day came suddenly and quietly. In another car, 
a man can be seen driving. This man noticed that something was strange, since it's the weekend and yet there aren't any cars. He asked if his lover noticed this too. He turned to the passenger side, and his lover's skin on the face was being peeled off, leaving the skull clearly visible. The man was shocked and horrified. A grim reaper suddenly appeared and positioned its scythe on the man's head. The man screamed loudly. It can be seen that several grim reapers roamed the city. A reporter tried to cover the incident on the field. She reported from a building in Gangnam, Seoul. She showed the viewers that the sky is turning purple from quite a distance. This one was also about to tell everyone that monsters have invaded this region. But she couldn't finish her sentence as she was suddenly dragged away by the monster. During that time, there were mysterious monsters and dungeons covered with strange skies. In the middle of that mayhem, the ones who acquired powers are called hunters. The inexplicable situation led people to believe divine judgment had fallen. The hunters who hunted the monsters began to hunt people in the name of gods, but it was in vain. A woman started running away from hunters to save herself. Right as the situation is heading towards the end, she was cornered and she told the men don't. But a man told her that if she says it that way, someone would think that they're harassing her. He told her not to worry, because with just one strike, it will all end painlessly. But then, the savior of the world came. He blocked the sword with his hand. Blood started dripping to his arm. And this person asked the woman if she's okay. It was the time where Zhang Shihuan appeared, centered in Seoul. This was also the time when he created the most powerful guild called the Junghua Guild. Kang Hu thought that's why people want to go to Oso oh Safe Seoul. He continued to listen to the radio, which talked about the White Rose Corps being tracked down by the hunter called Shiwan for plotting a terror attack at Exit 11 of Gangnam Station in Seoul. Kang Hu knew that the White Rose Corps wasn't a terrorist organization. The cab driver was thrilled to hear that the whole terrorist organization was wiped out by Shiwan. Kang Hu is well informed that the terror attacks weren't done by the White Rose Corps. The cab driver expressed that Shiwan, being a Korean hunter, is a source of great pride for them. Kang Hu knew that it was just all Shiwan's own play. The cab driver continued to talk to Kang Hu. He told him that his son recently awakened and is now planning to join Shiwan's guild. Kang Hu realized that if he were to go against Shiwan by revealing that all had been his doing, Shiwan would make him a villain. He remembered how the people would cheer for him to be executed. Because of that information, Kang Hu decided to be introduced to a mercenary corps, since any guild could be within Shiwan's reach. The cab driver informed him that they had arrived at the destination. Kang Hu thought that being a commissioned worker who only receives jobs from the mercenary corps would be the best for him. A woman greeted him and told him that he knew about him from Xiaoyong. She introduced herself as Li Yeren. Kang Hu decided not to reveal anything, so he introduced himself as Zhong Sun Kyu. They shook each other's hands. She scanned through the file that she's carrying and told him that she had a great collection of jobs for him. He straightforwardly told her that he'll pass. Instead, he requested for something with a good reward, starting with the hard ones first. Yaren was surprised, and she told him that she definitely heard that he's at level 10. Kang Hu replied that he is. She tried to cover her smile, but she eventually bursts into laughter. She laughed so hard that tears welled up in her eyes, telling him he was being ridiculous. She told him that too much courage is reckless bravado, and her expression immediately turned to an intimidating one as she asked him if he's trying to make him take care of his corpse. Kang Hu confidently replied that being mercenary is all about having skills despite the level. He checked the status window for the information about her constellation. Her constellation is called the Observer of Chaos. It is a constellation with the ability to distort and block sight. Yaren is a mage and buffer who made a contract with a mid to upper level constellation. And she's a character created to one day face off against the 13 stars. 
Kang Hu decided to win her trust. Yaren is covered in a glowing green light. She repeated what he said about being a mercenary is about having the skills regardless of the level. She sighed and lectured him that reality and the spirit are different. Kang Hu responded that prejudice and truth are also different. That made her smile. She has decided to check his skills. They stood face to face outside a building. Yaren made a ball of green light in her hand and told him that she'll just judge one thing. And that is whether he can avoid her skill. Kang Hu sought clarification on whether she wanted to test his ability to protect himself physically. She answered that he's correct. She explained that being able to dodge means that he can create opportunities to attack. Kang Hu covered his eyes. He noticed that she created puppets using fog, and being able to track even from faraway places, it's called the fog tracker. It is not an attack skill, so he knew he wouldn't die if he got hit. But if he can't dodge, traces will remain, and the test will immediately end. He told her that he's ready. She gave him a heads up that she'll be starting. The puppet fairy advanced towards Kang Hu. He watched the puppet's movement and prepared himself. He smiled when he saw a great opportunity, and he was instantly covered in green light. The impact of the attack caused debris to scatter in the area. When the smoke cleared, Yaren noticed that Kang Hu wasn't there. This caught her off guard. Once she sensed him, she turned to his direction, and she saw him running above her. She was baffled at the sight of him running on the side of the building. It doesn't make sense to her, especially jumping that high. She had observed that he's proficient in using the assassin's basic skill called short distance leap. Yaren grinned when she realized that he's not bluffing. She prepared for another attack and asked him if he'll be able to dodge again. This one then launched a powerful attack towards him. Her puppet advanced towards Kang Hu at an incredible speed. The puppet had almost got his foot, but Kang Hu kept running. The chase continued. The puppet got closer to him. Kang Hu noticed it, but he was unfazed. Instead, he smiled. As the puppet nearly reached him, he turned to face it and skillfully dropped onto his back, narrowly avoiding the attack. A bright green light erupted in the area. Yaren covered herself as she groaned in frustration. She knew he was able to dodge it again. She looked at where Kang Hu was, and she wondered if he had used Traver's teleportation. While she was lost in her thoughts, Kang Hu sneaked behind her and surprised her with his blade near her neck. He told him that they should end the test there. Yaren smirked. Kang Hu had observed that she's faster than what he was expecting, and he realized that she wasn't the mercenary commander for nothing. Yaren asked him if he had been trained before. He replied, nope. Using her fingers, she pushed the blade away from her neck. She told him that his movements weren't for level 10. He asked if he passed, and she answered that he did, and will give him level 50 commissions. He satisfied with that, so he placed his sword back in his sheath. A white car drove around the city. Yaren glanced at Kang Hu through the rearview mirror. She asked him if he's interested in bulletproof glass and shared to him that there's been an annoying gunman that has been following her lately. He asked about it, and she excitedly told him that she has been receiving lots of love from the Eclipse bastards. Kang Hu knew that it's a turf war. This lady's crazy. A puppet handed her a piece of paper. She told Kang Hu that the commission is all about tracking a wanted criminal. She shared that she's the commissioner, so the commission will benefit him. The puppet handed him the paper. The commission is in Gyeonggi Do Osan, an open dungeon also known as Abandoned Ruin. The person to track is Kim Muk Yoon, a level 50 mage, and the request is to retrieve a third rank item called Vartaros's Shoes. He asked her if he needed to bring him back alive. She answered that he can kill him since there have been too many civilian deaths caused by Kim Muk Yoon. She reiterated that he can execute him on the spot, and the Hunter National Security Agency would appreciate that too. Kang Hu had a big grin as she informed her that he will immediately begin. They have arrived at the location. Yaren told him, Kim Muk Yun would probably be hidden in a corner somewhere, and it wouldn't be easy since the place is quite big. Kang Hu thought that for him, 
it wasn't a bad place to make his debut. It's a place where Kong Hu used as a hideout in the novel, so he's quite familiar with it. In addition to that, there are quite useful middle bosses in there too. He stood in there, taking in the scene while some monsters started showing up. He noticed their presence. He took out his weapon and using this he cut his palm. He let the blood drip. And the monster witnessed this. Instantly it became ferocious and aggressive. The monsters rushed towards him. He used Traverse teleportation to dodge the attack of the monster. And then he used a short distance leap to cut the monster. He then again used Traverse teleportation to dodge the monster. And a short distance leap for his counterattack. He used the same skills again until the enemy was completely wiped out. He recalled what Yaren told him, that he needs to retrieve the commissioned item and then he can do whatever he wants. A monster in a human-like form holds a blade on each of his hands suddenly appeared. Kang Hu recalled his conversation with Yaren. She asked him what reward he wants to receive, and he answered that he wants a dungeon raid license. For the dungeons with many middle and last bosses, he smiled as he saw the monster. He's delighted that a useful middle boss has shown up. Kang Hu addressed the monster as Ventus, and he told him that it was nice to meet him. He saw a status window above Ventus, and it states that he can loot his target. Ventus replied, I'll kill you. He taunted the monster by saying that it shouldn't just stand there yapping. Ventus swiftly leapt and headed towards Kang Hu. As it came closer to him, Ventus multiplied, which surprised Kang Hu. He closely observed its movements as it evaded multiple Ventus who were after him. One monster leapt towards him to stab him. It gripped its sword and stabbed directly towards him. Fortunately, Kang Hu evaded it on time. He used his Traverse teleportation to dodge the attack. He had observed that the attack looked like a single attack with enormous power but he was able to pinpoint the location of the real deal. He used his short distance leap and ran straight to the real Ventus. He stabbed it in the abdomen. Ventus was caught off guard. Its blood gushed out of its body. Ventus instinctively counterattacked. Kang Hu used his traverse teleportation to evade the attack and move behind Ventus. Kang Hu knew that Ventus is a middle boss in name only. He's aware that Ventus's close combat is crude at best. He kicked Ventus on the back of his knee. It made Ventus knelt to the ground. Kang Hu equipped his weapon and prepared to stab Ventus. Kang Hu focused on the spot between the neck and shoulder and stabbed Ventus right there. Ventus's eyes widened in pain as Kang Hu continued to pierce his blade deeper into the flesh. After that, he forcefully pulled out his sword, causing more blood to gush out of Ventus's body. Then, Ventus's body started dissipating. A status window appeared to inform Kong Hu that he has seized the illusion skill from the target. After the encounter with Ventus, Kong Hu was breathing heavily, and he already looked exhausted. Ventus's body was completely gone, and on its location, an item had been dropped. Kang Hu noticed the glowing stone. Unbeknownst to him, a glimmer of light appeared from one of the buildings in the area. The light was due to the telescope that someone is using. This person spied on him as he picked up the item, and the person got excited upon seeing the rare item called Solacium. This person asked the man beside him if he saw that. The man did not expect that Kang Hu would hit Ventus exactly at the weak point. This man is the guardian of Osan. His name is Joe Young Jay, and he's at rank three. The woman with them told Joe Young Jay that he saw that person in the market. She encountered him when he was buying items like Sevuro brisket, cobalt blood, and anesthetics for monsters. To her, it seemed like he was about to hunt monsters in the dungeon and go farming. They continued to watch him until the other guy commented that Kang Hu is a pretty skilled assassin, and he admitted that he has never seen him around before. Joe Young Jay thought that Kang Hu is not a hunter who should be at a dungeon of that level. The woman buttered up to her boss, Joe Young Jay, by saying that Kang Hu is not a match for him. She asked if they should drag Kang Hu to him. She believed in his skill and was confident that he could break his bones. Joe Young Jay replied that there's no need to do that. 
It is because it would be easier for them to let Kang Hu rush so that they can loot after him. The three of them were delighted by that plan. To wait for Kang Hu to feel tired while they follow him from behind. Kang Hu is looking at his screen, which displays that he has reached level 16, and the next basic skill is at level 20. He decided to allot all his points to his stamina, and he's aware that as long as he manages his innate mana, hypersensitivity, he doesn't really need to put any points into mana. While he chews a leaf, he presses the screen to invest more points to his stamina. When finished, he felt a bit energized. The leaf that he was chewing is called solacium. It has a calming, pain-relieving effect and is an excellent suppressant for mana hypersensitivity. It's a rare item, and since it grows naturally, it was difficult to mass-produce. However, there's one person in the country who knows how to cultivate it, and that person is at ground zero. Kang Hu knew that the place was called DMZ in the past, and it's pretty far. He took a mental note to carefully prepare to reach the place. He's aware that if his hypersensitivity had gotten ahead of him during the fight, he would have instantly died. Our MC sighed as he thought of the situation he was in, but he had no other choice. He started strolling while thinking that he would also need to prepare a lot of money. Meanwhile, Li Yuren continued to drive during the set. She narrated that until a year ago, the call quality wasn't that bad. But it's getting worse with time. The person on the other side of the call told her that there's nothing they can do about it. Especially since she must be under Eclipse or Black Lion. And they should expect that it will only get worse. The person commented that it seemed like she's having a hard time after getting involved with the people from Eclipse. Yaren also noticed that there's a car waiting on the other side of the road. As she answered that it's okay, her expression became more serious, and explained that she had gotten used to walking around like she has eyes on the back of her head at all times since long ago. This lady started speeding up. The person on the line asked her if she had a hunter to recommend to him. She replied that she is also understaffed. She continued to drive as she lost the car, who tried to get in her way. The person on the line told her that he just only needs to get in touch, but she answered that she doesn't know. She told him that she wondered if she'll be able to refer to a hunter that he will like. The one she was talking to right now has this red halo above his head. She addressed the person on the line as Mr. Zhang Shihuan. She thinks her referrals would be rejected from the start. Shiwan replied that he would slightly adjust the standards. He informed Li Yaren that he wanted to nurture the lower levels properly first. Yaren replied that she had thought of a hunter like that. Shiwan was happy to know that. But Yaren informed him that the hunter would need a bit more time, so she doesn't want to jump to conclusions yet. Shiwan praised her by saying that her recommendations have never been wrong. He added that it was unfortunate that we lost them due to unfortunate incidents. Yaren replied that it was all in the past, so there's nothing to worry about. She told Shi Huan that she'll watch over the hunter a bit more, and if he gets verified, she will let him know. Yaren inquired if he had any useful information. Shi Huan informed her that he gained inside info on some crime syndicates. He'll send it to her through a secure email soon. Yaren was delighted and thanked him. Shiwan assured her that he can always help her with that kind of info whenever she needed. He expressed that their Yunghua Guild is in need of a lot of talent. Zhang Shiwan looked at the man that they have captured while telling Yaren over the phone that if she sends someone good, he will treat her the best way he can. But when he said that, he had a murderous aura around him. When the call ended, Yaren sighed. She thought that no matter how high his expectations were, how can he think of someone who just got his first commission? Meanwhile, Shin kang -hu had already engaged in a fight. He stabbed the monster right at the middle of its body. Immediately, he leapt backwards. This time, he's up against a middle boss called Ibria. His dagger was stuck on its arm. 
Ibria raised its arm. Kang Hu anticipated the attack. The arm got closer to him, but he remained still. Ibria locked him as a target, but its arm just passed through his body. The monster got confused. Then it grabbed a boulder instead. While the illusion magic is activated, Kang Hu runs fast. He thought of the weakness of the abduction skill. And that was because the wind-up action leaves too big of a gap. He decided to take advantage of that gap. Ibria threw that rock at him. Kang Hu was surprised to find the rock already near him. He immediately sidestepped and ducked as low as he could, and the rock hit the ground and shattered with a great impact. His body was underneath the debris, and only his hand was visible. But it was just an illusion. When Ibria saw that, she was surprised. With the use of Traverse teleportation, Kang Hu is already behind Ibria. He took out his sword and stabbed the monster from behind. Ibria groaned loudly as its body fell to the ground. The notification window displayed that Kang Hu had defeated a middle boss. With that, he leveled up. He had decided to put all his stats into stamina again. Then he looted the target's skill. Abduction skills proficiency is at max. He can summon a target within a fixed radius in front of him. That got him thinking. And then he practiced using abduction. His target was the dagger in front of him. And with abduction, his arm was extended until it reached the dagger. And he was able to retrieve that dagger from a distance without taking a single step. That proves that he can use the skill on items too. And if he used it well, he can use it to motion cancel to, and he practiced that. Little did he know he was under surveillance. Zhou Youngjie and the rest of his party watched Kong Hu. One of them commented on the guts that Kong Hu has. Youngjie couldn't believe that an assassin killed Ibraya without a single tanker. Their female party member asked what Kang Hu was doing. They assumed that he probably wanted to raise his proficiency. They asked Young Jae if it's time to mess with Shin Kang Hu. Since Young Jae did not answer, they called him again, which startled him. He got mad and yelled at his comrades that he already told them that they will move when Kang Hu is already tired. Meanwhile, in a scaffolding, a man ate a jerky. He was dirty, his hair was unruly, and his eyes were bloodshot. He looked at a document that states that Black Lion has given conditional approval to Kim Muk Yoon's joining of the organization. It states to pass on insider info on Blue Eyes to the mercenary corps that Lee Yaren runs. This man commented that it's good news for him. He is seated on top of a corpse while several corpses lay near him. He commented how Yaren is already antsy in catching him. His aim was the eclipse. But the black lion isn't so bad either. He got excited at the thought that he'll be able to step in Dejon for the first time in a while. But his smile vanished as soon as he felt someone's presence. At the bottom of the scaffolding stands Kang Hu. Our MC was already glaring at his direction. He smiled as he thought of that guy that he can rob. He knocked at the wall while inviting someone to come out. Three black mystical yet ferocious wolves appeared. The guy uttered that it's time to eat. The wolves were in a hurry to descend. They run fast and leapt until they're just a few steps away from Kang Hu. Kang Hu took out a piece of meat. That surprised the wolves. Even the master of the wolves was surprised and confused. The wolves excitedly ate the meat that Kang Hu gave them. The man was confused since those wolves are not the type to get so excited over normal meat. While they were eating, Kang Hu took out his sword and stabbed the wolf right in its neck. Then he proceeded to the next one, down to the last one. The man couldn't believe what he saw. Kang Hu revealed that the wolves were crazy about the meat for a reason. He made it specifically to suit their taste buds. He bought the meat in advance as if he already knew about these monsters. The wolves' bodies dissipated. With a serious expression, Kang Hu warned the man. He told him that if he treasured his life, he would give back what he stole. The man cursed Yaren. This man, named Kim Mukyun, dared Shin Kang Hu to come take the items if he could. 
Kang Hu agreed to do it his way and rushed to ascend the stairs. Mukyun commented how prepared Kang Hu is, but he lacked brain cells. He thought of him as an idiot to just rush into the enemy's camp. Mukyun prepared his explosives while thinking that it would be Kang Hu's death. Kang Hu activated mana tracing, and he had seen a lot of traps prepared by Mukyun. He took a step and proceeded with a short-distance leap skill. Witnessing that the traps had no effect, Mukyun cursed Kang Hu. He couldn't believe that Kang Hu easily dodged all the mana traps. He knew he was in a dire situation. He cursed loudly as he unleashed his power. He didn't let it scare him easily. Kang Hu watched him. He saw that Mukyun's power is called Fighter of Chaos. The notification window displayed that it is a constellation with the ability to make the enemy disoriented and lose vision. Mukyun proudly announced that he's a precious person that a constellation looked after. He taunted Kang Hu by saying that he will show him black magic of hell. Kong Hu used Traverse teleportation, and with a short distance leap, he's already a few inches away from him. He knew Mukyun was at level 50, a black mage with a disorienting constellation. Kong Hu knew what Mukyun had planned to do. He chased after him. Mukyun grinned and uttered that this time, Kang Hu wouldn't be able to dodge it. Mukyun activated C's vision. Kang Hu was surprised that everything had turned black. That darkness slowly approached him. But he continued pursuing Mukyun, thinking that it's not yet the right time. He continued to wait. He paused. And when he found the right timing, he blocked his eyes with his sword. Mukyun was taken aback. He inquired how Kong Hu knew the only method to defend himself. Kong Hu proudly says that of course he knew about it since he was the one who made that ability. Mukyun thought that he's just spouting nonsense. When he was already in line of sight, Kong Hu used abduction and the hand grabbed Mukyun. Mukyun couldn't believe that Kong Hu just used a monster skill on him. Mukyun complained that it was cheating since it didn't have a wind-up action, but Kang Hu clarified that it was just motion cancellation. With no way to escape, Mukyun received Kang Hu's sword right at his abdomen. Blood gushed out. Mukyun cursed loudly. He activated his mana burn, and that caused an explosion. Good thing Kang Hu was able to step back. Enraged, Mukyun declared that he would burn Kang Hu to death. Kang Hu noticed that Mukyun's continuous fire speed was irregular. He wondered if Mukyun is using an item to influence his awakened state. Kang Hu stopped running and faced Mukyun. Mukyun glared at him while he called him a fucking rat. He released his purple flames while he told him to die. It covered the whole area where Kang Hu is. Mukyun laughed as he saw Kang Hu's body falling from the higher ground. By this time, Mukyun's eyes are bloodshot red. He rejoiced as he thought that he defeated the bastard. But Kang Hu took a step, and with the use of illusion magic, Mukyun is seeing several clones of Shin Kang Hu. This triggered Mukyun. His anger pushed him to unleash more power, and he activated heat fall. Purple flames rained down on Kang Hu, but Kang Hu swiftly evaded all of it. Seeing Kang Hu move without taking any hits, Mukyun can only think. What kind of bullshit is this? Mukyun was in for a surprise. Kang Hu grabbed him from behind, one arm locked on his neck, while the sword stabbed him on the side. He complained that Kang Hu stabbed him at the same place where he stabbed earlier. He yelled loudly from the pain. Kang Hu threw him on the ground. He writhes in pain while cursing Kang Hu for making a fool out of him. Our MC smiled as he knew that this loser would fall for his plan. Kung Hu thought it was an incredible strategy. And then, the notification window popped out. It says that the constellation master of mobile warfare is giving high praise to his attack strategy. A small quantity of constellation power has been consumed, and a slight buff has been sponsored to Kung Hu. His experience increased by 0.1%. He looked at the sky as he thought of the unexpected event of him being sponsored. Although countless constellations observe hunters, sponsors are quite rare. It is because it consumes the power of the constellations. In other words, constellation power.
He looked at the notification window. It displayed a Dimension Looter, an embarrassing sponsor from a pathetic, low-rank constellation. It also displayed that it lowered his dignity as the owner of the contract. But Kang Hu assured him not to worry, and he'll make sure that choosing him would be the best decision the constellation had ever made. Kang Hu is D-mad to take every ability he possibly can. The constellation answered by showing the words lunatic, and it advised Kang Hu to focus on the prey in front of him first. Kim Mukyun was crawling his way out. Kang Hu obediently followed the constellation and stabbed Mukyun's leg. Mukyun called him a cruel bastard. He dared to ask Kong Hu if he thinks things will change just because he was able to capture one bastard like him. He taunted him to reply. This triggered Kang Hu. He recalled his past of being bullied. And he replied to Mukyun that if the world would change just by capturing a bastard like him, he wouldn't even be there. Kang Hu slashed Mukyun in half. A notification window displayed that he had killed the target and seized his contract with Fighter of Chaos. It displayed that Fighter of Chaos is now under control of Dimension Looter. There is now way to escape outside of extinction or termination of the contract. All of the abilities of Fighter of Chaos have been transferred to Kang Hu. Kang Hu clicked a button. He was happy he got the C's vision skill. He thought of taking Mukyun's items too. He grabbed Mukyun's clothing and took it off. Mukyun sure has a lot of items. He checked the pockets for money. He thought Mukyun would be stingy for level 50, but it turned out he must have used his money on the items. Kang Hu fit a glove on his hand. With this, he can take the mana string and connect it to the dagger, which will make it perfect for throwing. And he wore a vest and thought he should transform it for stamina usage. Then he got a ring that boosts endurance. It's a precious stat, so he can't just throw it out. And he also got an evil god's talisman. One mana is consumed every second he enters a state of awakening skill. Casting time is decreased. Among all items, to Kang Hu, it is the optimal buff. Now that he got all the clothes, he proceeded to check all the rank 9 items. Currently, Kang Hu is at level 19. And if he reached level 20 on the way out, he thought it would be perfect. He walked out with a smile, thinking that the assassin's livelihood skill is right in front of me. Strangely, he didn't see any monsters. He knew that the area was a usual spot for thorn-toed rabbits. He continued to walk while being oblivious to the surveillance team. They watched him from a scope. Seeing Kong Hu's state, Young Jay's party got excited. They prepared to move. Joe Young Jay gave the signal. His comrade understood it well. Then he released the bag containing the rabbits. Their plan is to exhaust Kong Hu from fighting all those monsters. The thorn-toed rabbits were attracted to the smell of blood. They bared their large front teeth, but Kang Hu had been waiting for them. In a swift move, he sliced several rabbits at once. Blood splattered everywhere. He had leveled up and reached level 20. He got excited since he had been waiting for that moment. Now he had obtained the assassin class basic skill, accelerated stabbing, and due to the abilities of his constellation, the skill has been upgraded to bloody stabbing. Bloody stabbing can overlap the bleeding figure of the target repeatedly. The female member of Young Jay's party commented that the rabbits died easily. Young Jay grinned and uttered, no. If anything, he saw that as their opportunity, since Kang Hu had his guard down. He attacked from behind. When he swung his sword, Kang Hu had used short-distance leap to evade them. Kang Hu wondered who that bastard was, trying to rob him. He acknowledged that if it had been a bit later, he would have lost his head. Young Jae wondered if his attack was too weak. He charged and uttered that this time he won't miss. But Kang Hu was able to evade his attacks and got close to him. Kang Hu used his bloody stabbing skill. In bloody stabbing, the recovery ability is limited to 10 stacks. Kang Hu planned to repeat his attack a few more times. But he was surprised to see that Young Jae was fine. Young Jae even taunted him by asking if that should be called an attack. Young Jae's comrades celebrated. Young Jae is a berserker, and the more he fights, 
the stronger he gets. Young Jay attacked Kang Hu with his gigantic sword. Kang Hu acknowledged that the opponent is strong, befitting of a berserker. Now, Kang Hu has become serious. He focused and used his bloody stabbing skill again since he saw that his opponent's gaps are too wide. Young Jay laughed at him for that attack and taunted him to try even more. Kang Hu grinned while thinking that he'll stab that man four more times. He moved quickly. But Young Jay noticed something different. Kang Hu had black aura coming from behind, and soon the darkness had spread and took Yung Jai's vision. It was followed by the skill swallow Chaos, and then Kang Hu used bloody stabbing four times. Yung Jai swung his sword blindly as Kang Hu attacked him from different angles. Young Jay was confident that shallow cuts like that are nothing to him. Eventually, the darkness disappeared. He glared at Kang Hu now that he saw him. He asked Kang Hu if he's done with his tricks. But unexpectedly, he felt something in his body. He's confused as to what happened. He couldn't believe that he was losing his strength over some pathetic cuts. Young Jay breathes heavily. His comrades got worried. Young Jay denied what had happened. He insists that the more he gets hit, the stronger he gets. Kang Hu used abduction. Young Jay saw the blade coming at him, and it hit him directly in his heart. Kang Hu told him that even if he has the Berserker class, he's still human in the end, and if he loses too much blood, he'll die. Young Ji fell to the ground. His comrades were extremely surprised. But they ran away and left him behind. Kang Hu chewed a plant while watching those two run away. He wondered if it was because Osean's Hunter National Security Agency closed down. A notification window displayed that Shin Kang Hu killed the target and seized his contract with Glutton of Blood. Kang Hu talked to the sky and asked how the taste of the Glutton of Blood was. He grinned and uttered that he already got two just today. And he asked if it's about time that he got the sponsorship. The reply to him was lunatic, which made him grin wider. The constellation window appeared to explain the glutton of blood. The more Kang Hu will lose stamina, the higher the possibility of becoming immune to mental attacks. Basically, a constellation that strengthens the mental state. Kang Hu finds it a good one. He walked up to the corpse saying that Zhou Youngjae had useful items. The magic resistance anklet and the shoes that increased movement speed. And the stamina increasing glove. If Kang Hu put those gloves on together with the throw use gloves, it's perfect. Then he left to finish his commission. A few hours later, in Dejon. Li Yerin was impressed seeing the boots. She didn't expect Kang Hu would find Vartaro's shoes easily. She thanked Kang Hu. Yerin revealed that the first commission served as a test and 50% are being filtered in there. In other words, 50% died. In his mind, Kang Hu acknowledges that thanks to Yerin's calculative mind, she had such a high success rate for high-ranking commissions. Yerin fulfilled her promise of giving Shin Kanchu a raid pass for a dungeon with a lot of middle bosses. In the document that she gave, it states that the place is called Wuthering Heights, located at Gapyong Station. There are four middle bosses and one main boss. She asked Kang Hu if he liked it. Kang Hu smiled at the thought that it's a dungeon with five skills that he can loot. He requested Yeren to book it tomorrow morning. And then he asked her if she would buy and sell items. Yeren was surprised at the goods that he had shown her. She commented how Kim Mukyun took a lot of items. She promised to give Kang Hu a good price. Then they moved on to the next commission. Kang Hu chose the document with a guy. It's the National Security Agency's Capture Commission. That guy is named Heo Jungtai. His crime is burglary of national articles and bodily harm. The reward for capturing this guy is 300 million won and a one-month lease of a level 100 or below dungeon. Yaren expressed that finding Young Tae's base will be hard. She asked Kang Hu if he would be okay. Aside from being last seen near the Yang Pyong station, Young Tai had no other appearances. Kang Hu told her that it's fine since he had a way to find him. 
After Kang Hu sold all the items he didn't need, he earned 250 million won. Easy money, baby. He decided that now he had increased his money. He also increased his lifeline. He called somebody on the phone. The person on the other line answered to ask who he was. Kang Hu ordered 10 salaciums, and the meetup place is Yongsan Station. The man on the other line replied that he understood. Kang Hu knew that he had time until his next dungeon raid. He stood in front of Club Hades to have a drink and collect some information. Upon entering, he heard a loud, Whoa! A man had sliced his opponent, and this opponent bled from his neck. And the winner rejoiced. The people nearby threw in their bets while Kang Hu made his way to the bartender. He ordered one glass of Salacium Burst. The bartender is named Benny. She was happy to receive the payment. She was friendly as she expressed that she didn't think anyone would order that drink since it had a unique flavor. She asked him to wait at the moment. Kang Hu knew that every now and then, bartenders on a club like that have some useful information. But he also knew that it wasn't verified information. He looked around and was surprised to see someone. It was a woman. She sat there while Kang Hu wondered what she was doing there. She is the subordinate of the Executive Eclipse member Kang Dong-hyun, the hunting dog, Cha Sohi. Shin Kang-hu felt a bit worried as he wondered if the Eclipse had begun tracking him. The bartender gave his order when he was looking at the woman, so that prompted the female bartender to comment that it was a shame since she hasn't seen a handsome man like Kang-hu before. She said that it will be difficult to see Kang-hu from then on. Kang Hu asked why. The bartender shared a rumor. It looks like Eclipse is planning to get the club. Kang Hu assumes that their plan is to sort through the hunters in there and drag them into the mine. That's Eclipse's typical human trafficking strategy. He wondered if that's the reason that So Hei is there. He internally complained that he can't even have a glass of alcohol in peace. He decided to move quickly, but they were all surprised by the loud noise. When Kang Hu saw who was coming, he cursed. Several men oozing with murderous intent approached. That was the moment Kang Hu realized that he was fucked. Other patrons were surprised by the Eclipse members. They were terrified and panicked. Even the bartender decided to run away. The Eclipse member warned, be careful on what you do. And they scattered to get the precious goods. They grabbed a man and punched him in the gut. The others tried to put up a fight. And then one Eclipse member was irritated at how Kang Hu stared at him. He swung his axe while he asked Kang Hu if he wanted to die. But Kang Hu hit him first and used Traverse teleportation. The Eclipse member was confused. Then his blood was spilled. Kang Hu had killed two Eclipse members. Now the others became wary of him. So he also had her attention towards our MC and watched him. And she became fired up. She immediately moved and dashed towards him. Kang Hu was alarmed to see her coming his way. She pulled out her knife and threw it towards Shin Kang Hu. Kang Hu was surprised to see that, but instead of hitting him, it hit the man behind him. So he went straight for that man. She pulled out her dagger from the man's chest and the man screamed from pain. The man probed why she was acting that way. But Sohei disregarded his question and had sent the man flying towards the wall. Sohei looked fierce. Kang Hu watched her. He wondered what she was up to. Sohei looked at him and told him that it's her first time seeing him, and he caught her eye. She inquired on which guild he belonged to. Kang Hu replied that he didn't like being tied down anywhere. Sohei answered that it was better. She asked if he's open to talk about business. But of course, it would be after leaving that place, the Eclipse members whispered among themselves. They got confused since it wasn't part of the plan. They couldn't understand why the investigator was attacking them. Sohei got their attention. They read her lips that said, attack us. The Eclipse members charged at them. That is when Kang Hu realized that it was all part of Cha Sohee's plan. So he got ready to fight. Kang Hu wondered if she's testing his abilities. He decided to play along. He threw out his dagger, and it went straight to a man's chest. Other Eclipse members were taken aback. They decided to attack him now that Kang Hu doesn't have a weapon. 
But Kang Hu smiled at them. His dagger went flying back at his hand, and he used that to slash the incoming enemies. After that, everyone became wary. So he noticed that Kang Hu used telekinesis. She continued to watch him. Kang Hu invited her to the emergency exit. Then he ran. The Eclipse members were about to chase him. But before they went off, so he told them to chase to enlist Kang Hu. Then she took off. So he asked if he's really an assassin who also used magic too. Kong Hu smirked while thinking that as if he's used magic. It was a glove that had a string attached to it. He took it from the commission he got earlier. But he let so he think as she pleases since there's no need to expose anything about himself. Kang Hu kicked the door open and noticed that there were people already waiting for him there. The club made an announcement to their customers. The staff announced that there are currently insiders from Black UDN trying to create a disturbance within the club. These people kicked the customers and dragged them towards the detention center, and it stated that Eclipse was trying to suppress those people from Black UDN. One man swung a hammer at Kong Hu, but our MC easily evaded that. Then he slashed the man's shoulder, and he elbowed the man on the neck. Kang Hu's attention was grabbed by the notification window when it appeared. It states that the constellation Disciple of Justice has been touched by his actions of punishing hypocrisy and evil. They are consuming constellation power to sponsor a buff for Kang Hu. His experience increased by 0.1%. He happily thanked the sponsor. He went to attack more people while thinking that the justice part was laughable. Before he hit his opponent, it had already been struck on the head. He looked behind and saw Sohei. While he fought, he thought if justice really exists in their world. But he didn't care that much. He knew he could repay his sponsor. An axe was thrown at Kang Hu. It hit the wall. Kang Hu stepped on it to elevate himself. His jump shocked his opponents. Kang Hu thought that he could easily repay his sponsor with three villains. He used his short distance leap and slashed all of his opponents in one strike. He landed on the ground. While so he retrieved her knife from the head of the man. She expected that fight from Kang Hu. She watched him kick the door open. And then Kang Hu looked at her and pointed at the door. As so he expected, her eyes were right. They have left the building. Kang Hu and her stood side by side. While the enemies frantically searched for them, they were hidden in a corner. So he then took this opportunity and asked for his thoughts about working in a place freer than a guild. She was elated when she gave her calling card to him, while saying that the pay will be good. Kang Hu grabbed the card and told her that he will contact her after dealing with some pressing matters. Then he walked away. So he left, and when she brushed her hair, she had an earpiece, and she uttered, Yes, master. She reported that they have finished things there. She replied to her master that investigating is easy, and she asked for the name, and they're talking about Chung Myung Detention Center's Kang Hu. A funny scene happened when Shin Kang Hu commented that Dimension Looter didn't talk about the sponsor earlier. Funny enough, Dimension Looter was speechless. The next day, at the train station. Footsteps of a man alighted the train. It was Kang Hu. And he thought that judging from Sohee's reaction, he's not wanted yet. But as a precaution, he decided to ditch Dejon for now. The situation annoyed him a bit because Eclipse is extending its influence, since they've been watching the trains going to Gapyong recently. So rather than taking a direct train to Gapyong Station, where the dungeons are, Kang Hu decided that it would be safer to go via Yongsen Station. Kang Hu took out a box from the mail. He was happy to see that the plant that he ordered was delivered without a problem. In the novel, Kang Hu uses a hidden space near the station and receives Silesium. It was fortunate that he knew the route. He then heard a man on the phone say that his part-time job is the best. It only needed a bit of acting, and then he can proceed to dungeons in Seoul. The man saw Kong Hu staring at him, so he yelled at him. The man dashed away while demanding the other person on the line to come to Yongsan Station. A picture of a man was up on the billboard. Many armed people are in front of it. Seoul is the place where the Yonghua Guild's clever dungeon monopoly occurs, with safety as collateral. 
but it's also the only place the national agency actually does its job, since it can operate a market of that size and have killer prices. But the market is one and a half times bigger than other areas, so it's not that bad. Kang Hu lifted the weapon Blue Sky Joy. It increases the strength by 50. Kang Hu decided it's time to move on from the practice dagger. He held the dagger in his left hand while a rock in his right hand. He gripped the rock tightly until it smashed into pieces. He was pleased with the strength. Blue Sky's Joy. When out of combat for more than 30 minutes, stamina recovery speed is doubled. Aside from the strength, Kang Hu is pleased with its effect. Unlike other hunters, he doesn't have to worry about mana, but to use mana hypersensitivity, he needs to take care of his stamina. He decided to go with that weapon. He walked out the street while holding his newly bought dagger. And then he heard someone exclaim, Wow, exciting! He saw a mother and a father pulling their luggage while holding their child, who was asking if they could eat chicken again for dinner. The mother agreed since they are in Seoul. They felt safe that the National Security Agency and Yunghua Guild protects them. Kang Hu's face turned sour. In his mind, it was an epitome of blind faith. All of a sudden, there was a loud scream. The child that Kong Hu saw was being abducted by men in black clothing and a mask. The man begged them to let his child go. The kidnappers told him to be sincere and he made a money sign. The people around them panicked. They wanted someone to call the National Security Agency. Kang Hu couldn't believe that people would do something like that in the middle of Seoul in broad daylight. He thought of them as stupid. He thought of giving them one blow, and then he'll leave the rest to HNSA. All of a sudden, a man with a smile told them that he'll be the one to show sincerity. Kang Hu was surprised to see that person. The crowd recognized the man. It was Chai Guan Hyung. People got excited upon seeing the Yunghua Guild's Guan Hyung. The constellation Devil War Spirit appeared. A constellation with abilities in swordsmanship and spatial separation. Kang Hu didn't expect to meet Jiang Xinhuan's colleague. Guan Hyung isn't the type of guy to step in situations like that, so Kang Hu finds it unusual. Guan Yung threw a card, and the kidnapper received it. He wondered what it was. Guan Yung told the kidnapper to withdraw the amount that he wants in exchange for the child. The kidnapper was delighted and immediately released the child. They pushed the child, and Guan Yung was quick to catch the child. And all the kidnappers quickly run away. Guan Yung emits black aura around his hand as he touches the ground, and he was gone in a snap. Kang Hu expected that Guan Yung would be strong. He's a swordsman who specialized in spatial usage. He emerged in front of the kidnappers. When he took a step, the surrounding area near the kidnappers were covered in black. The kidnappers wondered what it was. In an instant, Guan Yung attacked them. He sliced their bodies in half. With that attack, the mask of the kidnapper was torn, and it revealed his face. Kang Hu remembered that it was the hunter that he saw earlier at the station. The other kidnapper saw the body sliced into two, and he couldn't believe that Guan Yung did that. The kidnapper begged for his life since he just did what Guan Yung asked, and he told them that they just need to act. The people watched them, but they couldn't hear anything since they were inside Che Guan Hyung's black bubble. The kidnapper, scared for his life, prepared to draw out his sword. He prepared to attack. But Guan Yung was faster than him. Guan Yung smiled. The corpses lay on the ground, and as his bubble disappeared, he told everyone that it's now safe. Kang Hu sighed. He was disappointed that his expectations were right. They used outside hunters to raise the public's trust in the Yunghua Guild and created a pretext to monopolize rights. In his head, he told them to enjoy as much as they can for now. Since the opportunities allocated to Chai Guan Hyung would be owned by Kong Hu later. In another setting, a man holds a document and apologizes. He offered all the information that they could get to Sohei. It is the information on the escaped prisoner. Sohei reviewed the document, 
and stopped at one part of it. She took a good look at Kang Hu. Meanwhile, Kang Hu was about to enter a dungeon. The guards who were stationed at this place tried confirming his identity. This one was already reserved for Shin Kang Hu. Back to Sohi. She checked the photo and smiled. She uttered that he looked familiar. Back to our MC. He asked the guard if he could go in now. The guard replied that the dungeon initialization is complete. However, there's one thing that puzzled them. They informed Kang Hu that his level 20 status is lower than recommended. They asked him if he would be okay. Kang Hu knew that if he wanted to steal the opportunity from Chai Guan Yung, he needed to level up. Otherwise, at his rate, not only will he miss the opportunity, but he could be hunted. His minimum level goal is level 50. He admitted to himself that if he wanted to grow fast, he needed to suffer at least that much. He confidently told the guards that he'll be okay. Inside the dungeon was a sandy area and the wind was blowing hard. It was hard for him to see. If he hadn't left any traces, he would have lost his way long ago. He got slightly nervous when he was about to step on the edge of a cliff. He almost fell. He looked at the other side and wondered if the path got cut off. He looked behind and saw several menacing eyes. There were several rake lizards. Kang Hu smiled since, if it goes well, he'll reach his goal faster. Simultaneously, the rake lizards attacked him. Back to Cha So He who stared at the document. The man informed her that they tried simulating the process of how Kang Hu escaped. So he asked for the results. The man thought that Kang Hu fished them using mana. And they thought Kang Hu just got lucky that he fooled a level 100 hunter. However, they saw that it doesn't make sense on how he succeeded in the following attacks. It would be impossible for someone with the abilities of a level 10. So he looked at the mark drawn before Kang Hu's escape. She thanked the chief, and she revealed that she met the escaped convict a few days ago, and her estimation of Kang Hu's level is at least 100. The chief was dumbfounded. So he released a flame on her hand, and with an annoyed expression, she asked what those trash materials were. They weren't even able to grasp Kang Hu's level. Back in the dungeon, Kang Hu was focused on fighting the rake lizards. He threw his dagger to the rake lizard and it hit its stomach. And as he expected, his target was on point, but the injury wasn't that much. He thought to himself that it would take forever to catch them all. He pulled the string of his dagger, and in one slash of his dagger, he hit several rake lizards on the stomach. He recognized that there were two rake lizards with no injuries so far, and he attacked them. His dagger is back at his hand while the corpses of the rake lizards stack up. He taunted the rake lizards to come at him. The rake lizards looked menacing. There were several of them rushing towards him. He's aware that there's something to be careful of when hunting monsters. And that's damage. Even if the monster dies, if the hunter weren't able to damage it, it is considered that the hunter did not hunt the monster. But what happens if one succeeds in injuring the monster, even if it's only a little bit? Kang Hu took a step. Because just a little bit of damage could cause a significant change, the rake lizards chased after him. At the edge of the cliff, he used short-distance leap to reach the other side. All the monsters who jumped fell on the cliff while he landed safely on the other side. He watched those rake lizards fall to their deaths. The rake lizards hit the ground head first, causing them to instantly die. The notification window displayed that Kang Hu had defeated a normal monster. Several of the same notifications followed as more monsters died. With that, Kang Hu's level had rapidly increased. He had reached level 27. He was glad that his plan worked. In another setting, So He investigated the mark drawn on the floor by Kang Hu. She knew he did the rites with blood, but she doesn't understand its purpose. She wondered if he called a constellation. Then she answered her master's call. Her master asked if she had finished the investigation. She reported that she is still in the midst of it. She shared that the escaped convict is not your average Joe. Her master thought of that too. So he requested one person to be with her. Her master asked why. So he explained that what the chief said was something that didn't add up. She got pissed off and almost killed him.
Back at the dungeon, the corpses of the rake lizards dissipated. Kang Hu had retrieved a crystal. His face turned sour when he was reminded of his time in the mine. He assumed that So Hei probably had figured out that he's the escaped convict by now, but he won't let himself get caught easily. A flame-covered monster appeared. It looked terrifying as it walked upright with its whole body burning. Instead of panicking, our MC smiled. Kang Hu had been waiting for that monster. He got excited about his first skill. Unbeknownst to him, someone watched them from afar. The guy concealed his face under a mask. His weapon is a bow and arrow. A few moments later, Kang Hu stood by the oasis where the corpse of the flame-covered monster floated, and the flame in its body had been extinguished. A notification window displayed that Kang Hu had stolen the skill imbue fire element. He will be able to upgrade the skill based on the constellation's abilities. He is now able to imbue the fire element on all weapons. The man with bow and arrow continued to watch him. The man was shocked that Kang Hu was able to hunt the middle boss that fast. He described Kang Hu's as really refined. Kang Hu kept his distance while he stabbed it with his dagger. The fireman got triggered and it chased after Kang Hu, but he planned it that way so he could lead it into the oasis. He used illusion magic to trick it. Then he made it run into the oasis himself. The observer realized that Kang Hu's actions aren't for low level. There's a reason why the captain is so interested in him. Li Yaren ordered this spy to follow Kang Hu around. He looked at Kang Hu's file. Yaren explained that Kang Hu's test results were really good, but his low level poses a concern for Yaren. She told the man to help Kang Hu when he was in danger and she told her to be sure to tell Kang Hu the advantages of team play when that happens. This man concluded that Kang Hu would definitely be a great help to Blue Eyes if he helped them grow a bit more. He decided to follow Kang Hu for a while. As for Kang Hu, he tossed his dagger. His opponent formed a barrier around itself and deflected the dagger. Kang Hu pulled his dagger back. He commented that the monster's defense is sturdy. He's up against a middle boss rear defender, middle boss side defender, and middle boss front defender. They formed a straight line, and with their abilities, they formed a solid barrier around them. It was funny when Kong Hu asked them if they're trying to prove that they're doing three people's worth. He commented it was team play covering each other, and Kang Hu was reminded of Yeren's words. A little flashback, when Kang Hu bid her goodbye. Yaren stopped him for a bit, and then she told him that taking requests is good. Then she inquired if he had thought about working full-time with them. She reminded him that dungeons aren't too easy and that he can do it all alone. Our MC didn't respond right away. He grinned and expressed that he doesn't want to tie himself down since it's not his personality to share things. Back to the fight scene, he used the short-distance leap towards the middle boss. Kang Hu went to its side and attacked it from there. Then he moved to the next side, using traverse teleportation, and slowly darkness crept up. When he activated the seized vision, he used shallow chaos. And then he stepped back using a short-distance leap. He watched them carefully and uttered that it was good. He was in the perfect distance for abduction to work. The middle boss was flustered. Our MC used this skill to isolate this one from the rest. He approached it discreetly, and the middle boss tried to sense him. He kept circling at them. Then he commented that it is the reason why he doesn't want to work in teams, because of the consequences of relying on others when he can't even take care of himself. He attacked again, used traverse teleportation, moved to a different side, and used short distance leap. He grinned as he dealt the final blow. And it was a complete defeat for the middle boss. A notification window displayed that he defeated the two middle bosses, one middle boss is still standing. It rushed towards him. His face was terrifying, but Kang Hu was dead set on defeating it. He used traverse teleportation, and he appeared at the back of that boss. He was caught off guard when the middle boss dropped its shield, turned, and was about to punch him. But he was just playing with it. When the middle boss punched him, it was just his illusion. He called it dumbass. The middle boss got nervous. 
Shin Kanchu got closer to it, and he slashed the middle boss using his sword. It weakened and fell to the ground. Now, the third notification window displayed that he had defeated a middle boss. With that, his experience had also increased. Kang Hu leveled up and reached level 29. He pulled out his sword from the middle boss's body. Notification window displayed that he had obtained the skills side defense, rear defense, and frontal defense. The three skills have combined to create the skill Protection Barrier. Protection Barrier is an installation-type barrier. The barrier lasts until durability has been depleted. Kangu chewed a plant while he looked at the screen. He finds it interesting to turn into an installation type after getting maxed out. He found it really useful. The spy was amazed. He's starting to get convinced that Kangu wouldn't need a team. But he corrected himself, thinking that it was too early to conclude that. He watched him walk away. He decided to conclude his thoughts about Kang Hu after he watched him defeat the main boss. Kang Hu arrived at a place where the sky is crimson red. The ambiance was creepy, and the fog made it more dramatic. A zombie-like man appeared. The spy continued to watch Kang Hu. The spy felt nervous. Kang Hu greeted the zombie. This zombie had sharp teeth, white hair that covered the eyes, and long, sharp nails. From the start, this zombie's blood burn skill was what Kang Hu is after. From a distance, the fireball of the zombie can be evidently seen against the eerie backdrop. This zombie was fierce as it released several fireballs at once. Its skill is called Dark Purple Fireball. It rained down fireballs, but Kong Hu easily dodged it with his short distance leap. When Kong Hu got closer to it, the zombie sensed the danger, hence it put up a defense magic. Then, when it was floating high up in the air, it used Wind Arrow. Kong Hu chewed the salatium while in a fight. He had a hard time finding a good angle. The zombie released its attack and it rained down several arrows. Kong Hu ran incredibly fast to avoid it. This zombie had spammed its skills. On top of that, it used defensive magic on its back. Malay is the best way to kill a mage, so Kang Hu accepted to get hit just to get close. But he'll end up bleeding for sure. And when that happens... The bastard's signature skill, blood conversion will kill him instantly. He ran around while thinking of another way to approach this zombie mage. The skills it had shown so far must be all but so far. Kang Hu had only shown his leap. The zombie mage doesn't know what other skills he had. Red fog covered the area. The spy witnessed that the zombie mage and Kang Hu aren't able to deal a decent blow on each other. He didn't think that Kang Hu would be taking long to find out his opponent's weakness. The spy then got terrified because the zombie mage released a powerful gigantic attack. Its eyes bulged as it gritted its teeth. Kang Hu commented that it must be starting to get annoying. It released several purple fireballs. Kang Hu decided to get serious and show this zombie mage what he got. Large fireballs hit the ground while Kang Hu ran around to avoid it. But he was not terrified. Instead, he smiled as he saw this as a great chance. He's within range. He used the abduction skill. And from the air, it pulled the zombie mage close to him. The zombie mage was furious and it accumulated potent power in its hand. Kangu cursed as he noticed that it might be casting a spell even in that situation. And then a loud explosion happened. Debris flew everywhere. The spy hid so he won't be hit as well. Then it continued to rain down lightning-like attacks. But Kangu was already behind it because of Traverse teleportation, and it taunted him when he said, Cast all you want. The zombie mage was surprised to see Kang Hu from behind, but unexpectedly, it smiled. From a large orb of purple fire in the sky, it released the fireballs towards Kang Hu. But Kang Hu cut its fun early. He activated a protection barrier to keep himself safe from the attack. He used imbue fire element on his dagger, and the blade turned reddish-orange. And then he stabbed the zombie mage, leaving the blood gushing out and then he used his ability to burn. 
and that set the zombie mage in red flame. Its body was reduced to ashes. Kang Hu was pleased with the imbu fire element. The spy was astonished that Kang Hu killed Alicia, the zombie mage alone, even with his low level. With that, he had already decided what to report to Li Yaren. A notification window displayed that he had stolen a skill from the target. The skill was Blood Burn. With that, he had completed the main goal for coming in there. And he also noticed that the spy had also left. A notification window displayed that his level increased greatly. He had reached level 32, and he had obtained the basic assassin class skill, Accelerate. He commented that he leveled up smoothly. He chewed on a plant again while looking at the screen. It showed that the constellation Master of Mobile Warfare greatly praised his strategy. He donated a slight buff using a small amount of constellation power to Kong Hu. It increased Kong Hu's experience rate to 1.3%. He was pleased with the unexpected donation, and the yellow screen appeared to reveal the comment of the Dimension Looter that the master of mobile warfare provides useless donations without knowing shame. Kang Hu noticed an item at the bottom of his feet. He picked it up. He thought that item would be useful. Meanwhile, in the city, So He is on the phone reporting to her master that she found the place where Kang Hu stopped by. It was locked, but it's not a problem since she can just burn it down. She decided to go in and look for evidence. In one of the doors, a guy listened to the conversation. He immediately texted his client to inform them that Eclipse has found the house and they're searching for traces of Kang Hu. When Eclipse entered, as expected, it was empty. So he's master expressed that Kang Hu makes him want him more. This caught So he off guard. Her master explained how Kang Hu doesn't hesitate when moving. He's careful but bold at the same time. So he knew her master would like him. Her master replied that Kong Hu's cautiousness is a useful trait that So He doesn't have. Kong Dong Yun added that Kong Hu would be a good competition for her if he comes to work for him. So He wasn't happy with that. Dong Yun asked if they found any useful traces of Shin Kang Hu. She found a document. That made her think that the owner of the house is a hunter. Han Seo Yan hid outside her apartment building as she called someone. Unfortunately, that person did not pick up. Eclipse found out that she's part of the Blue Eyes Guild. Back to our MC. Kang Hu left the dungeon. He knew following Alicia, the zombie mage was critical. The blood burn he stole was his main objective, but the dropped items weren't bad either. Selling the green magic stone made him some good money, around 50 million won. And he can't forget about the ring that enhances the bleed effect. He also got a useful skill book on top of all that. It's not for his class, but he found a way to use it, so he decided to keep it for now. He sensed his phone in his pocket. Now that he's away from the dungeon, it's starting to receive a signal. He took a look at it. It was a text message from Han Sioyeon. She told him that Eclipse came to investigate him and they're after him. Kang Hu was glad he got that heads up. He couldn't help but comment how fast Cha So Hei is. He thought about Han Seoyan. He wondered if what he just experienced is the informational power of the Listening Flower Guild. And as he expected of a satellite guild of the Yonghua Guild. He knew that if Eclipse had caught on to his movements, they'd go looking for Yaren soon. Since to Yaren, he's just someone whom she made business with. She won't have any reason to protect him if he doesn't join her. But the Blue Eyes Guild is at odds with Eclipse over Dejeon, so there's no reason for them to help them out and give away his information. So as he planned earlier, he'll go catch Jung Tae. He alighted the train. He would need help for the job. So he planned out that when he arrived, he should meet someone first. A red-haired man was under the scorching sun. He wondered if he'll be able to catch Yong Tae. He remembered a memory when he talked to his superior. He was advised to stop it despite being invested in the case because of his hometown friend. And the superior reminded him that the incident in Yang Pyong is out of his jurisdiction, back to the present time. He stared at the building in front of him. It was the last home based on the records. 
he ascended the staircase and knocked on the door. A man came out and asked who he was. He asked if there's a man named Jungte living there. The man replied that he lived alone, but the red-haired man scanned the area. He noticed the gun near the sink. He asked the man if he's a hunter. The man asked if it was because of his gun and explained that he only had it because the world is too dangerous and he's confident that everyone had at least one. The red-haired man apologized and left the man alone. His back is turned against the door while commenting that the place isn't what he's looking for. But the tenant left the door ajar. And then he grabbed his gun. He smiled and aimed at the backside of the red-haired man. But the red-haired man sensed it, and he immediately unsheathed his sword. And he sliced on the crease of the door. The tenant yelled when his gun and fingers were sliced. The red-haired man was furious when he uttered, So, you're a gunner. The tenant ran inside the house while the red-haired man entered. He advised the man that if he wanted to use the excuse of self-defense, he should have taken off the silencer. The red-haired man kicked the gunner, and he landed face down on the ground while spilling blood all over the floor. The red-haired man seized the gunner's neck with the swords on each side. He asked about Jungte. The gunner admitted that he only saw him once because of a commission, and Jungte would kill anyone who looked for him. He added that all he knew is that Zheng Te hid alone secretly, and he doesn't know who is backing Zheng Te, but it's definitely someone scary. Someone backing Zheng Te was a fresh news to the red-haired man, a few moments later, outside the building. The man pondered if the reason the Yangpyong investigation was stopped is related. He then sensed someone. There were several men in uniform. It made him wonder why the National Soul Security Agency is there. He hid to avoid being spotted so he could get to his hideout. The leader of the three men asked if it was that way. They're coming closer to the red-haired man, and it made him panic. But the three men stopped on their tracks when Kang Hu struck a conversation with them. He had something to ask them, but the men explained that they're currently on a mission. But Kong Hu insisted and told them that he was robbed by a hunter on the big road. He kept talking to them while pointing in the opposite direction. The red-haired man took this chance to discreetly leave. The red-haired man ran towards a covered area. He thought he was lucky. But Kang Hu smiled as he had planned this all along. He was glad to see that the man had made it safely. This red-haired man took out a book from the shelves. It was an album, and he looked at the picture of him and his colleague. He recalled the past. His friend congratulated him for going to Seoul. His friend was happy for him. This friend heard that in Seoul they use quite some power unlike in other places. His friend asked if he's doing joint assignments with Junghua Guild too. The red-haired man was flustered, and his friend told him to leave it to him. He assured the red-haired man that he'll take responsibility in their hometown, so he could go without any worry. His friend encouraged him to protect their own justice in their own separate ways. The red-haired man was surprised when someone entered his hideout. He recognized that it was the man who talked to the National Security Agency earlier. He asked how he knew about the place. Kang Hu called the red-haired man Yu De Hoon and the current estimated level for him is at 362, and he works for Seoul NSA. Dohoon was alarmed, he immediately placed a hand on his sheathed sword. He asked if Kang Hu did a background check on him, or if Kang Hu is from NSA. Kang Hu replied that he is not, but he revealed that he knew why Dohoon was looking for Heo Jungte. Kang Hu proposed to work together. Meanwhile, Yaren is talking to someone. She mentioned that it was a shame that the person in front of her is not interested in the mercenary corps. But she was pleased because this person is incredible as a commission taker. And after a bit of time, she thinks she'll be able to recommend him to Jiang Shihuan. Their conversation was interrupted with a loud noise. Someone can be heard yelling, how dare you? Go back right now. Yaren got serious and asked what that noise was all about. It was Cha Sohi. She pushed open the door. She uttered how she finally found them. Yaren stood up. The person with her knew that the lady that trespassed was the person known as the hunting dog. 
Yaren was triggered when Sohi came there. She immediately exuded her menacing aura. But Sohi assured her that she didn't come to fight, so she advised Yaren that there's no need to be on guard. Sohi showed her a document with a picture of Kang Hu, and she confirmed if Yaren had seen that person before. Yaren was surprised. Dahoon was suspicious, and he asked what they would work together for. Kang Hu asked if Dahoon thought that if he caught Jungte, it would be the end of it. That caught Dahoon off guard. Kang Hu told him that he won't be able to handle it, even more so if he worked at the Seoul NSA. Kang Hu inquired if he had a difficult time obtaining his friend's information there. Dahoon knew it was true since there was a time he was told that he couldn't access it because Yang Pyong is out of his jurisdiction. He told Kang Hu that it was only because of jurisdiction. Then Kang Hu asked why the NSA happened to be there, almost having run into him earlier. Dohun straightforwardly asked what Kang Hu wanted to say. Kang Hu revealed that Jungte has support, someone big enough that even the NSA has to be on guard. Dohun remembered that the gunner told him the same thing earlier, and how he's being told that Yang Pyong is out of his jurisdiction. Dohun asked who it was. Kang Hu revealed that the support is one of the Yung Hua Guild's core people. Dahoon's face was now covered in sweat. He dismissed Kang Hu saying he was talking crap. Kang Hu made sure to let him know that he doesn't care if Dahoon believed him or not. But the fact that they both want Yung Te remains. Kang Hu told him to go to the square tomorrow at six in the evening and he'll meet Yung Te there. Our MC clarified that it's not a trap, and he encouraged Dohun to investigate if he's suspicious. Kang Hu asked something in exchange for his promise, and that is for Dohun to work with him. Back to these two bitches. So he asked Yeren if she saw that person. She recognized it as Sun Kyu, but now she figured out his real name is Kang Hu. She assumed that if the Eclipse sent the hunting dog, they must be quite interested in the man. Yaren told them that she doesn't know the man, so he got triggered. She cornered Yaren by saying that she already confirmed that she was recommended to that man. Yaren admitted that she was recommended, but their conditions didn't match up, so it got canceled. And with a menacing aura, she asked Sohi if she got it. And she warned her that if she doesn't want to fight, she better fuck off. Sohi bit her lip. She warned Yaren that she better not be lying. So he stormed out, Lee. Yarin instructed her subordinate to assign eyes to Sohei and monitor her movements. Then she thought that if she let the man know about the crazy bitch Sohei, it would make Kang Hu and the Blue Eyes Guild's relationship stronger. The sun was shining brightly outside the building. A man received a text message that someone was looking for Yungtai. The man smiled and called them stupid bastards. It was Yungtai and he uttered if they really didn't realize that he was just hiding in plain sight. A man tailed Jung Te. It was Kang Hu. He revealed himself when he said that Jung Te goes home at three in the afternoon. Kang Hu commented that it was later than he expected. A notification window showed the Priest of Darkness evil-leaning constellation. Combat abilities are improved when facing hunters who serve neutral or good-leaning constellations. Yung Tae's expression showed how furious he is. He tried to dismiss Kang Hu by saying that he was the wrong person. But Kang Hu used C's vision. Yung Tae took a step backwards, and he immediately ran away. Kang Hu thought that for him to dodge the C's vision when he used it right in front of him, Heo Jung Tae must have a high resistance to magic. Jung Tae wondered if Kang Hu was the bastard that looked for him. Kang Hu looked around. Jung Tae took out his weapon. Since someone knew his hideout, he needed to do one thing. He needed to kill the guy. He tossed several kunai at once. Meanwhile, an explosion happened. So he set a man's shoulder on fire. The man told her that he didn't know anything. He emphasized that he doesn't know who Kang Hu is. So he then burned him alive. She was utterly displeased. She recalled how Kang Hu told her that he would contact her. Not only did he not contact her, but he also disappeared from Dajin within a few days. From that, Sohei realized that Kang Hu recognized her from the start and escaped. On top of that, the boss mentioned that he's a good competition for her.
She stomped her feet in anger. She thought of him as an enemy. If he's going to take her master's favor away from her. She let out a breath and comforted herself by saying that sometimes it's okay to make mistakes and that her master would understand if she accidentally killed Kang Hu. Back to our MC. Several kunai were on their way to pierce Kang Hu's back, but he activated his barrier skill that he got from the three weak bosses. Young Tae was surprised to see the shield. He got confused since he knew the guy was an assassin. Young Tae moved at the speed of light, but Kang Hu could still track his movements and evaded all the attacks. Jung Tae got annoyed, but he acknowledged that Kang Hu had good visual acuity. He noticed that Kang Hu is putting some distance between them. He wondered if he's doing that to dodge and observe him. He went to approach him from the side. He took out his kunai and decided to hit Kang Hu up close. But Kang Hu already used abduction. Jung Tae was surprised. His movement was restricted and he was lifted in the air. He yelled, no, how? Kang Hu took out his dagger and then he used bloody stabbing. Blood gushed out from Jung Tae's body. Kang Hu revealed that he already planted his mana in the places that he thought his prey would hide. With that, he determined where Jung Tae is, and every time Jung Tae had to move, he could clearly see his root. Jung Tae groaned in pain while the blood in his body gushed out. Jung Tae decided to retreat for now. But Kang Hu told him, it's pointless. Jung Tae's injuries worsened and more blood spilled out. Then Kang Hu used his blood burn ability. Jung Tae danced in pain while groaning loudly. He rolled around on the floor in pain. Jung Tae's pain turned to anger. He vowed to rip Kang Hu to shreds. He threatened him with his backer. Kang Hu revealed that he, in fact, knew who it was. The Yung Hua Guild's Chai Guan Hyung. Jung Tai asked him how he knew, but Kong Hu told him to shut up. He pulled out a rope and told Jung Tai to sleep. Later that day, Do Hoon went out of his hideout. He was in deep thoughts. Kang Hu's words about the NSA echoed in his mind, especially when Kang Hu told him that there's a lot of work that NSA deals with through apps, but Do Hoon used that too often to consider it as just a death keepsake. Kang Hu suggested that his friend's account is still valid. Do Hoon looked at his smartwatch and opened the profile of his friend. Our MC explained that for the NSA to dispose of that account, they would have processed his friend as killed in line of duty. But Heo Jung Tai's backer wouldn't have wanted that, and Kong Hu assumed that they wanted to deal with it as quietly as possible. The Seoul and Yangpyeon NSA, which received pressure from this backer, must have chosen to cover the account up instead of following the procedure. But the few who could log in the account must have read the investigative information and came to the villa. With a serious expression, Kang Hu asked him if he was able to keep his promise. Do Hoon must collaborate with him using that account. Do Hoon thought that if Kang Hu is telling the truth, then it's true that it's the Yunghua Guild and NSA's fault. If that's the case, Do Hoon wondered what he should do. He arrived at the square, and Kang Hu greeted him by saying that he's late, since Kong Hu had been waiting for him. Do Hoon demanded to know where Jung Tae was. Kong Hu assured him not to worry, since he brought him. He grabbed Jung Tae's hair, and it revealed that he's injured and unconscious. Upon seeing that, Do Hoon immediately realized that Jung Tae used stealth. That's why it was difficult finding him. Shin Kang Hu revealed that he purposely chose a time when there's a lot of people around. He told Do Hoon that if he arrests Jung Tae now, even his backer wouldn't be able to do anything. But he also informed him that if Do Hoon wished to fulfill a personal revenge, he won't stop him. He asked Do Hoon what he wanted to do. Yu Do Hoon was surprised with his words. The sun was about to set. A crowd had gathered in front of the masked Kong Hu. Someone yelled to move aside. It was a man from NSA. The man asked Kong Hu if he's the one who contacted them about Young Tae. He answered yes and brought out Young Tai by grabbing him by the hair. The man from NSA seemed like he's in distress. He stuttered when he praised Kong Hu for his good work. 
He asked how he managed to subdue him when Zhang Tai is famous for his hiding skills. Then the man asked for Kang Hu's hunter registration number so he could give him a reward. Kang Hu inputs his details on the phone. He gave the phone back and the man thanked him for his cooperation. He informed Kang Hu that they have sent 300 million one reward and the dungeon lease. Nighttime came, and Dahoon gazed upon the stars. Kang Hu approached him and expressed that he was surprised that Dahoon refused to have revenge. Dohoon blushed and mentioned that if it was his friend, he wouldn't want that to happen, since both of them wanted a place that can be trusted in a tough world. They wished for the NSA and Junghua Guild to be like that, and with a serious expression on his face, Dahoon expressed that they would like it if he could make the NSA pay for their faults, and that is why, if Kang Hu's words are true, then he can't let the Junghua Guild and NSA be. In his head, Kang Hu recognized that Dohoon would walk the same path as what it is in the book, like the Dohoon who led the revolt against the NSA. In the novel, he was a villain and the Yunghua Guild's enemy, the same with Kang Hu. And then Dohoon would be caught by Guan Yung because of the Yungte incident in the novel. But this time, they didn't leave any traces, so Kang Hu assumed that it would be okay. Dohoon expressed that he was surprised. That Kang Hu's favor was because of the reward. Kang Hu nonchalantly replied that he's not the type of person to do volunteer work. As he thought about the other reason, he smiled. To him, cutting off Guan Hyung's legs and arms is a huge reward. We then see Guan Hyung looking at a report that Jung Tai was arrested with both arms crippled. The subordinate reported that Jung Tai's life was in danger, so they moved him to the hospital. Guan Yung replied that it's fine since Jung Tai is already useless to him now. Guan Yung had a murderous aura when he demanded to know which bastard did that. The man checked the phone for the hunter registration number. He was confident that it was there, but his expression immediately changed to shock. Guan Yung asked, what's up? The subordinate explained that the information had disappeared. Another account officer deleted the information but it was the account of someone who's dead, so the subordinate assumed that it was some kind of glitch. Guan Yung couldn't hold back his anger and surprised the subordinate when he smashed the table into pieces. Guan Yung uttered, Are you telling me to believe such bullshit? He scolded the NSA and asked what the soul officers were doing. They trembled in fear as they tried to explain that they went to Yang Pyong, but there were no suspicious characters. Guan Yung's nerves popped out in anger as he yelled, What kind of bullshit is that? He was about to punch them. Then he heard someone say that he should calm down. That made him stop, and a large red marking appeared in front of him. It crackled, and along the bright light, Jiang Shiwan emerged. He calmly asked what was wrong. Back to these two, Do Hoon told our MC that he was surprised because Kang Hu's favor was because of the reward. Kang Hu nonchalantly replied that he's not the type of person to do volunteer work, and it's for that reason that he took Heo Jung Tae's items. Do Hoon refuted that even when Kang Hu said that, he still helped him to obtain revenge. Kang Hu told him that there's no better ally than the enemy of his enemy. Do Hoon got confused. Kang Hu revealed that he needed a sword to attack the Zhonghua Guild with. That's why it's not a bad decision to help Dohoon with his revenge and gain an ally. When Dohoon heard that Kang Hu's target was the Junghua Guild, he commented that Kang Hu is like the protagonist of some novel. Kang Hu would never imagine himself as the protagonist. He clearly knew that he was not the main character of some novel. The villain Kang Hu exists as a contrasting shadow so that Shiwan could shine. Dohoon informed Kang Hu that he will return to Seoul. Kang Hu watched Do Hoon walk away. Under the night sky, Kang Hu entertained the idea that after possessing the villain, Shin Kang Hu, was exactly the development he wanted to write in the novel. His expression was a bit sullen. Meanwhile, a little recap. Guan Hyung's nerves popped out in anger as he yelled, What kind of bullshit is that? He scolded the NSA and asked what the Seoul officers were doing. His anger rose as he thought about how it happened in the area where he got rid of the CCTVs to hide Jungtae. He asked which bastard was it. 
but then someone told him to calm down. Shi Huan emerged from a red mark on the door. Shi Huan commented that Guan Yong isn't in the best mood. The NSA were happy to see him. Shi Huan told them to leave. It was like they're hypnotized. Their pupils turned red and they immediately obeyed Shi Huan like a robot. Shi Huan and Guan Yong then sat down. Shi Huan spoke first. He asked Guan Yong what was wrong. Guan Yong explained that the tool that he was using was broken. He thinks that someone screwed Zheng Tei on purpose. His anger got ahead of him and his tone rose when he uttered that who the fuck would dare to do that. Shi Huan called his name in a serious tone, and he told him that he always said this. Guan Yong was confused. With a menacing aura and a dead serious expression, he told Guan Yong to maintain some dignity. Then he asked again, what exactly is the problem? Guan Yong was intimidated. Shi Wen told him that it doesn't matter if such pests exist or not. He added that all enemies who came to block their dream would become ash. In Yangsu Station, Buyong Mountain, a man touched the dog statue. It was Kang Hu, and he sensed that it's right there. Behind the dog, there's an opening of a cave that emits such an ominous aura, although it was a hidden dungeon in the novel for the protagonist, Shi Wan, to take advantage of. Kang Hu had a serious expression on his face. He went inside with the resolve to make it to his advantage by using it well. He walked inside and eventually, he had to draw out his dagger because of a monster. A middle boss called Zhang Yong appeared. Kang Hu knew that Zhang Yong is complicated to deal with and it's dangerous when it managed to sneak up on him. He faced Zhang Yong. It had three eyes that glared at him. And then Zhang Yong used his ability called Shadow Steps. A bigger version of Zhang Yong that is made out of shadow appeared, and then it immediately vanishes. As it went to leap, several creatures like that were there. Kang Hu was slightly nervous, but he knew how important timing is in that fight. Several gigantic Zhang Yong charged at him. He prepared to throw his dagger, and when he found the timing, he released it. It stabbed one of the arms of Zhang Yong. Then Kang Hu moved his hand, and he targeted three Zhang Yong in one swift move. After that, his dagger pierced the ground. He threw his dagger again when several Zhang Yong rushed towards him. Then he summoned another weapon. The Zhang Yong moved quickly, one of which decided to attack from the side, while another one is coming from the front. Kang Hu had his sword ready. But the Zhang Yong used an ability called Exchange. Kang Hu was surprised. He realized there's also a monster behind him. It looked terrifying. It punched Kang Hu, but he used illusion magic. Then he pulled back his dagger. Yan Yung looked around. It was confused when it was left alone during the fight. Kang Hu threw his dagger. It glimmered in the sky as it fell right into the center of the skull of Yan Yung. With a powerful force, it pierced the skull. Kang Hu watched it from behind. Zhan Yong fell face down on the ground. Kang Hu observed the corpse, and he thought to himself that he did well. Zhan Yong must have never thought that he would use illusions and hide nearby, much less that he would track his attack and attack at the right timing. The body dissipated. Notification window displayed that he defeated the middle boss. Then he looted a skill from the target. The skill is Shadow Steps. It had the following conditions, and these were those. Kan Hu commented to Zhang Yong that its skills are pretty OP. He was pleased with the conditions. He told Zhang Yong that he will make use of it better than him. A notification window displayed that Kang Hu's level had increased greatly. He had reached level 33. He said that the first step has smoothly been completed. On the other hand, Guan Yong told Shi Huan not to get too complacent since nothing is absolute. Shi Huan asked what he meant. Shi Huan was serious and furious. He hovers over Guan Yong as he tells him that the world is moving with him in the center. He declared that he is good, he is justice, and he is the way. Shi Huan was really a one hell of a guy. Che Guan Yong asked Shi Huan if what he meant by that is that he is the protagonist. Zhang Shihuan answered, Exactly. And he declared that he is the protagonist. Back in the dungeon, a new monster appeared. Kang Hu wondered if it's a main boss. 
He recognized that it was similar in the novel. Kang Hu is in the middle of a fight with another Kang Hu. It looked exactly like him. It was the main boss, Shin Kang Hu. The doppelganger took out his dagger and used his short distance leap, while the real Kang Hu bent his upper body to evade the attack. Then he took a step and raised his dagger. But the doppelganger deflected it easily as well. The real Kang Hu examined his enemy and determined that it was going for a hand to hand fight. If he used illusion magic, it would get caught with mana tracking, and since they both have C's vision, they know each other's weaknesses. So, he thought about short distance leap combined with abduction. It will be hard to avoid it. In the end, all that's left is using skills that require physical contact. The doppelganger pushed real Kang Hu's dagger away. He watched the main boss carefully. He used traverse teleportation to find a blind spot. Then he prepared his dagger. Our MC immediately used his blood stabbing skill. But the main boss has a counter to this, and it was the protection barrier. Kang Hu told the main boss that it was a pretty good move. He then used Imbu fire element on his dagger. He challenged it to see how long it would last. Several Kang Hu appeared that confused the main boss. Then all of it used shadow steps. The main boss got annoyed. It attacked one of the Kang Hu. But our MC grinned at him as if he had been expecting this move. Kang Hu activated the exchange skill and he was swapped with his illusion. This made the main boss furious. Kang Hu brought out his fire imbued dagger and proceeded with bloody stabbing while the main boss activated the protection barrier to defend himself. But eventually, the barrier started to have cracks, and the main boss was surprised when it shattered. It groaned. Then he moved quickly and attempted the bloody stabbing. One of the Kang Hu took a direct hit, but it laughed in the end. The main boss sensed someone approaching from behind. Kang Hu leapt and went to stab the main boss, but it was able to put up a protection barrier again. When the protection barrier shattered, all the Kang Hu started running. The main boss was desperate to counterattack, but his attack just went through the thin air, and then Kang Hu appeared behind him. The main boss tried to move quickly, and it threw the dagger which ruined the shadow, and then the main boss looked around. It used its ability and immediately put up a protection barrier. Kang Hu mocked it when he said he should keep trying. Then he leapt and instantly broke the protection barrier. The main boss was surrounded by Kang Hu. It extended Tinsan in an attempt to form a barrier, but the barrier was already imperfect. Kang Hu uttered that it seemed like the main boss had reached his limit. The main boss had a doomed expression on its face. Kang Hu told the main Sa that it probably lacked the mana to keep using the barrier. He grinned as he told the main boss that it probably wasn't able to copy his mana hypersensitivity. The main boss got nervous. He knew he fucked up. Then Kong Hu activated bloody stabbing. He stabbed the main boss several times and blood gushed out from several wounds. It painted the grass red with its blood. The main boss was already breathing heavily. It grits its teeth and decided to leap and run away. But Kong Hu watched it. He snapped his fingers and it activated blood burn. Purple flames engulfed the main boss's body. It screamed loudly. Its body became a fountain of blood. Then it fell to the ground. Its body started dissipating. Kang Hu expressed that it's thanks to that main boss that he got to feel it for a while. That his mana hypersensitivity is quite useful. A window notification appeared to show that he had obtained the skill enhancement, one-time use. He chewed a plant again while looking at the screen. He aimed for the dungeon because of that skill. He had decided what skill to go with. A series of maxed level skills were written on the screen, and from max, it got upgraded to ultimate. He was pleased to have gotten his first ultimate skill. He looked up at the sky and saw the whole area dissipating. He was pleased to block one of Shi Huan's chances with what he just did. He was glad that he made it a one-time dungeon, but he never thought he'd get a red crystal on top of getting a skill book. Red crystals are rare ingredients used in upgrading items or skills. He admitted to himself that he would have been jealous if Shiwan obtained it. 
he kept it for now. He decided to use the skill book for assassins first, since it really suited his chosen class. He opened the book. A mysterious aura surrounded him. The first lesson is called Watch Your Back. When attacking targets from behind, the assassin will deal 33% more damage. Eventually, he had completely studied the skill book. He told himself that he'll find out how effective it was in his next battle. Then he decided to move on. He needed to deal with Yung Tai's commission. The next day, near Pyong Taik Station. Yaren uttered that she never saw him outside of Dejan before. Kong Hu sat down in front of her. Yaren took out her phone and told him that before anything else, she had a question. She asked why he deposited a hundred million won into her account, and she showed her phone to prove it. That's all the time we have for today. If you want to watch the next part, please like and subscribe. Thank you, and see you on to the next one.